Senator Jasinski. Mr. President, I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant Arms be instructed to bring in our absentee members. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, motion does prevail. The Secretary will close the roll. Members, please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is the Reverend Jen Collins of Grace Lutheran Church in Apple Valley. And following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Greetings to you all this morning. I invite us to pray in whichever way you see fit. So let us begin this morning. Great way, my maker. This morning, as we prepare our hearts and minds for this work, the duties and tasks at hand, we seek to settle our bodies and ask for calm and steady and peace of mind and body and spirit. We pray for all the leaders in this space, provide them with wisdom, clarity, and assuredness in all that they do this day and throughout the session. Secure our steps when they are on rough terrain, shifting sands, fine or wide roads, narrow paths into unknown or whatever may come. Thanks be to the multitude of names of who you are known as. Hear our prayers, the spoken and unspoken. Amen. The secretary will take the roll. Senators Abler, Anderson, Bach, Benson, Bigham, Carlson, Chamberlain, Champion, Clausen, Coleman, Swazinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Duckworth, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Fate, Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Ingerbritson, Isaacson, Jasinski, Johnson, Johnson, Stewart, Kent, Kiffmeyer, Klein, Coran, Kunish, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Lopez, Franzen, Marty, Matthews, McEwen, Miller, Murphy, Nelson, Newman, Newton, Osmick, Pappas, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rest, Rosen, Rood, Senjum, Thomasoni, Torres, Ray, Utke, Weber, Westrom, Weger, Wickland. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. Senators Anderson, Benson, Clausen, Gazelka, Johnson, Kent, Miller, Newton, Rose, uh, Rosen, and Thomasoni. A quorum is present. Beginning under the second order of business, executive and official communications. The following communications were, were received. Please make note, there is no action required. Moving to the fifth order of business, reports of committees. There's a committee a report to be read at the desk. The secretary will read the committee report. Senator Rosen from the Committee on Finance, to which was re-referred Senate File Number 4410, a bill for an act relating to state government, reports the same back with the recommendation that the bill be amended as follows, delete everything after the enacting clause and insert, and when so amended, the bill do pass. To the adoption of the committee reports. Senator Housley. Mr. President, I move that the committee reports printed in the agenda and read by the secretary be adopted with the exception of the reports pertaining to joint rule 22.03. On that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, motion does prevail. Moving to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 4113, 3052, 4165, and 4410. The Senate files are given their second reading. Moving to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of bills. The bills on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Moving to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We will adopt the motions, author's motions as one motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, motion does prevail. Senate resolutions 126 and 127 are referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Housley. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bill be made uh, available on special orders for immediate consideration. And members, the list is on your desk.
Members, the individual bill on special orders is Senate File 4062, number 98 on general order. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Yes, uh, we do have a short list today, so uh, I'm standing between probably us leaving for the uh, weekend, at least some will be, and the nice weather that we're going to enjoy. 72 degrees on Saturday, believe it or not. Member seven, this is the uh, uh, um, Environmental Natural Resource Finance and Policy uh, Committee coming together in one bill, uh, which is always what happens. Um, Senate File 4062 has been a, uh, a, uh, a lot of work that has gone on, not only this year uh, by Senator uh, Chair Rood and her committee with policy, but also uh, the committee that I chair, which is the Environment Finance Committee. And over the years, we've had several, several uh, uh, discussions on what to put in the bill and what not to put in the bill. So a lot of what you're going to see in the bill today uh, has been in the bill before. We voted upon these uh, these articles before, or these these. Uh, uh, statutes before um, and, and um, so they're, they're going to be somewhat similar in nature than last year. The difference is, of course, members, as you all know, this is not a budget year. So our priorities this year were uh, very, very minimal. And in my particular area, uh, a priority was one bill that, that, that uh, uh, spent uh, one point or one million, about approximately one million dollars of general fund money. And that's lottery in lieu, and I'll explain that in a little, in a little bit. Overall, um, uh, fiscal items of note that are in the bill, and then, and, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, I will then turn over to uh, Senator Rood the lands bill. Now, those of you that have been around some time know that the lands bill comes forward every year. In fact, there's been several members in the, in, the, uh, in the Senate that have carried that, and she will go through that. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a little of the highlight of the financial uh, portion of the bill. Um, items of note are the Lake Town Township Wastewater System Design. Um, that is a, uh, that's taken out of the environmental fund of $86,000 per year. Um, we also have the uh, score grants. We all know what score grants are. They go out to uh, uh, waste, or excuse me, uh, landfill uh, organizations that deal with our garbage, our ongoing uh, dilemma of garbage. And the uh, uh, score grants are very popular. And there's uh, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars that was appropriated for that. And that again is taken out of the environmental fund, not the general fund. Another one is the uh, uh, whole. Effluent Toxicity Ruling, uh, which is taken out of the Environmental Fund, $671,000 for that. Um, another uh, point of interest, uh, um, we have the St. Louis County Trail Funding, ORV Trail Ambassador Grant, which, which is my bill, and the Shooting Sports Facility, which is Senator Rood's bill. Again, those dollars are taken either out of the Environmental Fund or the um, game and fish and heritage enhancement uh, accounts. Uh, White Bear Lake water levels, there's some dollars that are expended there as well, 496000 Again, that's taken out of, out of uh, game and fish and enhancement uh, fund. So these funds are replenished every year by either uh, if it's a snowmobile account or a, a four-wheeler account. Uh, through the gas tax that is uh, spent uh, yearly by people who are out enjoying the environment in, in Minnesota on uh, their snowmobiles or four wheels. And the funding that we do for them has been just kind of an ongoing uh, thing year after year for trail design and trail maintenance. And uh, now we have, of course, some, some uh, folks that we want to put out uh, to do the monitoring, uh, and we're going to call them trail ambassadors. They're not going to be uh, obviously, anybody that, that can make any arrests, but they could be out there to help people if they need help and, and uh, give them general information. Um, 
members, the, so the, the appropriation is uh, approximately $1.47 million from the general fund. That's the lottery in lieu. Now, I know that's uh, somewhat confusing. There's been a lot of talk. There's been a lot of talk that we're going to be taking money out of the environment. That's not the case. Uh, lottery in lieu, as you know, is different than than uh, the LCCMR funding. The LCCMR funding, by the way, passed the uh, uh, my committee yesterday and will be coming to finance uh, next year. I think that appropriation is about seven seventy million. Uh, that's an ongoing yearly appropriation. But the lottery in lieu. Um, uh, bill that you see before you is taking out uh, one percent of the general fund for events promotion. Uh, it also adds one percent uh, to the lottery uh, to the lottery corpus fund. So actually, uh, a shifting of dollars, and of course, what's not, what's, what's not including is is the big events, the events that are going to come to Minnesota, and that money is going to be distributed evenly with the seven county metro uh, area and rural Minnesota for large events. Uh, you pick your event. You have one up in the northeast part of the state, northwest, southwest, uh, in the metro area, uh, a large, large event that's going gonna, gonna to help bring those people to town and guess what they're going to do? They're going to spend money and part of that sales tax that they, they actually bring in or as a result of these large events, which is quite exciting. Uh, I think it's something that we should all be uh, really excited about here in, in, in the Senate. The, these dollars are all going to eventually come back and go back into the environment uh, when people come to town to visit. So uh, it's a real win-win situation. Uh, that is the purpose of that particular general fund appropriation and the only one that we have in, in the bill. Um, I think it's fair to note, and I, you know, I can, I can wait until somebody inquires, but I'll be upfront about this, about the funding that went on last year. The environmental agencies received an increase of general fund of 11% over the base budget and 8% increase over the previous biennium. During the budget year, the DNR's budget increase is almost $50 million, about 5% uh, over and including $28 million increase in the general fund. The PCA budget increase was almost $40 million, which is about 8%. Bowser's budget increased by $5 million, about 9%. Remember, this is last year. This is during the budget year. These agencies also received $491 million in legacy and environmental trust fund appropriations last year. And again, they're going to be getting funding uh, that they will be managing through their budgets this year with the environmental the environmental money coming from LCCMR. So the two bills coming this year, just a point of interest, there's $71 million of the Environmental Natural Resource Trust Fund, and I talked about that earlier, that's going, going to be appropriated this year, and $159 million from the Legacy Outdoor Heritage Fund that Senator Root oversees that uh, I believe is already uh, coming through the system. So. A lot of money going into the environment. Uh, Minnesotans can be very proud of the spending that uh, the Senate and, and, uh, and proud of themselves to have voted for these amendments over the years. And, and, uh, and I think uh, being guardian of those dollars uh, is, is one of the responsibilities that we all take very serious, and I know I do. And, and uh, we try and stay within the boundaries of the, uh, within the Constitution. And, and if we don't, uh, we'll be really letting down those folks that uh, want those dollars to go into the environment. So I think overall, I think we've been doing a very good job with that. Um, members, there's a, a very um, lengthy, uh, not lengthy, but we have three different articles in the bill, as you see, article with, with the financial, and I just finally I went over that. I also have the uh, overall policy, and then we have the lands bill. So I think at this time, I'll turn it over to Senator Rood uh, to go over Article 3, which is in the back of the uh, latter part of the bill, and uh, she can go through the uh, lands bill. Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is the uh, annual uh, lands bill. The legislative uh, authorization is required um, for the DNR to make changes in the state parks and state forest boundaries and to sell certain surplus um, 
state riparian land and to sell surplus state land by private sale or to sell surplus land for less than the market value. The bill includes provisions authorizing the addition of lands to a state park boundary and the addition and deletion of lands from state forest boundaries. It authorized the public sale of three parcels of surplus state riparian land, the private sale of one parcel of surplus state land, and the private sales of two parcels of surplus riparian lands. Um, it has been well vetted by the DNR and both the policy and the in, um, finance committees in, in, uh, in the Senate. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those really um, incredibly sexy bills that you really love to, to read. <laughs> uh, it's, a very necessary, it's a very necessary bill for the DNR to function. And so if you have any questions on that, I'd be glad, happy to stand for questions. Senator Ingebrigtsen, final comments before we begin amendments and discussion. Thank you, um, and thank you, Senator Rood, for that. And, and she's right, it's, it's one of the, uh, the ones that you kind of uh, gloss over when you go through the lands bill. It's been that way since, since I've been here in the 16 years, and you look at it, and, and uh, uh, it's rather confusing, but the DNR, DNR does a fabulous job of putting this together, and there are parcels that have to be sold, and, and, uh, and that's how they go about doing it, and it's on, on a yearly basis. So um, with that, members, I'm going to run real quickly through the, some of the other policies. I have se several sections here, and I think I'll just run through the, and highlight them before we start amendments. Uh, section 1 is a permitting efficiency report due uh, uh, with the Department of Natural Resources. Section 2 is the unadopted rules. Section 3 is a transfer of off-highway motor vehicles. Allows current owners to uh, not just register owners, but, or excuse me, to apply for transfer of ownership of off-highway motorcycle vehicles. Um, section 4, issuance of snowmobile registration decal. Section 5, display of snowmobile registration decal. Snowmobile manufacturing requirements are in the bill, uh, Mr. President and uh, um, the transfer of snowmobiles, conforming changes, definitions of ATV, uh, uh, somewhat significant there, going from 200, or excuse me, from 2,000 pounds to allowing 3,000 pounds to be on our trails. Uh, transfer of ATV, allowing current owners to register uh, transferring of ATVs. Uh, language is in there. Uh, the loose line trail connection, deadline for Timber payments, timely uh, environmental review of metallic minerals, uh, minnow, uh, uh, minnow importation is in here. That's, I think, that's of interest. Uh, um, permissible firearms, uh, which changes the, the current law from uh, the shotgun zones. It would actually now turn to uh, uh, if, you, if you have a, a, a hunter that prefers to hunt with a rifle, that would now be... Uh, in this bill, it would be legal. Um, I do have an amendment uh, with regards to that here shortly. Um, antler point restriction has been around some time. Um, members, there was a time when we wanted to raise these big bucks for, big whitetail bucks for hunting, and, and uh, we did a test zone for down in the southeast part of the state for three years. It was very successful. Uh, there got to be some really nice deer taken down there. Uh, then the uh, legislature decided to put that in, in law in that particular section. This repeals that, takes that out, and allows uh, hunters to take whatever deer that they wish. And, I, and members, it's always, it's always good to know that, that people are waiting for that big deer, but we also need to take, uh, quite frankly, as many deer as we possibly can, as many as the DNR will, will allow us. They want us to take a lot of whitetail because, you, you, as you well know, they're, they're all over the place. Not only are there hazard on the road, but chronic wasting disease is, is something that, uh, uh, that requires uh, the, the culling of the herd, if you will, taking more deer. So we, we're hoping that, that that will happen. Noose and bears, uh, you're wondering why bear language should be in here. That's my bill. Uh, where right now, the policy of the DNR, if they have a nuisance bear, they go out and they dispatch the bear on the site. My bill says you trap the bear, and there's bear trappers that actually will come in. They will trap the bear, and they will actually move that bear to a different location, a different location that the DNR would say is, would be approved, uh, giving that bear an, another chance to live uh, and also be, you know, be sought after by hunters as well. Uh, I, I have to say that. 
we do have in here uh, open season on wolves. I understand, members, the uh, wolf uh, thing has been somewhat controversial over the years. Uh, back in 11 and 12, they were taken off the endangered species list due to the numbers were, were increasing. Uh, we had uh, two successful years of taking of the animal, managing the animal. Uh, it has always been my philosophy, and I think the lows of those of a, a, of a few in the state that believe that that animal should be managed just like any other animal that we manage or the DNR does. They've now been put back on that list, endangered list. So what this bill does is it, uh, the uh, DNR has had the opportunity and has done a good job of putting together a, a plan should that come off, should they come off the endangered species list. That's all this does. This not, this not override the, uh, the, federal, uh, the federal position that they're taking in the Endangered Species Act. So uh, this, this thing could go for two or three years. It could actually end up next year. The, the point of this legislation is that as soon as they come off the list, uh, the DNR will be ready to, to manage the animal. Um, other things, uh, importation minnows, uh, there's been some talk about that. We're running out of shiner minnows in the end of the, I know this is really quite exciting stuff here, but uh, there are fishermen that run out of minnows and, and the, the importation thing has been talked about a long time. I know Senator Rood's done a lot of work on that. And uh, the DNR's, uh, uh, I think, starting to come around a little bit with that, but uh, they were always worried about bringing in the AIS uh, from other states, and that, that was uh, part of the pre reasons we haven't been able to get it across the line. Um, there's uh, language in here about White Bear Lake water appropriation, um, also water appropriation to facilitate uh, tree growth. Uh, there's language in here again from last year from uh, the calcareous fen uh, legislation, changing that, and transfer of water permits. Uh, so members, there's... Uh, there's a lot of different things, uh, most of which you've seen. Uh, in fact, the ones that I would be going through, uh, uh, the next two pages here would be stuff that was in the bill last year. And I think you, uh, you know, I don't want to bore you with some of this, but I can, I can if, you, if you'd like. But if you have any questions or anything, uh, I think we can certainly go right into it here. Um, and I know there's going to be, there's certainly going to be some, some, uh, some amendments. This gets into also the PCA water permits. Uh, uh, I think that's certainly of interest. Mattress recycling is in here. There's uh, been a problem of uh, getting rid of the mattresses, so this is a uh, portion of the bill that tries to address that. Um, and so some chemical plastic recycling uh, language in here, and, and uh, EAW petitions, uh, events promotion. Again, I talked about that uh, as well. And other points of interest, uh, proceeds from tax forfeited lands uh, is addressed in here. Um, air permits, there's always some, something with MPCA, state Im impl implementation plan revision, uh, the MPCA to seek EPA approval of modification of Minnesota's Clean Air Act. That language is in here. And uh, PFAS monitoring plan, uh, Expenses prohibited from the PCA from managing PFOS uh, monitoring under the under its March 220 excuse me 2022 PFAS monitoring plan and Red River phosphorus management plan. Members, that's that's really kind of it in a in a in a quick nutshell. Uh, but uh, Mr. President, I'd like to start out with the uh, with an amendment, the A4 A54 amendment. The secretary will report the A4 amendment. 54. A54 amendment. Senator Ingerbritson moves to amend Senate file number 40, 62 as follows, page 3, de lines, delete lines 7 to 9. This is the A54 amendment. To the A54 amendment, Senator Ingerbritson. Uh, Mr. M Mr. President, members, uh, after a long lot of discussion uh, when the bill actually came out, uh, uh, we're reconsidered uh, three different areas in the bill, and this addresses those areas and takes them out. Uh, and also addresses the uh, rifle zone area in the Dodge and, and Olmstead County. Basically, it's a carve out for those two counties. Uh, they've been a lot of, lot of uh, uh, concern about um, that particular area. I've not heard concern from any other areas in the state, but that particular area really absolutely uh, wants our help to be able to carve this out if we're going to go with rifles because of the population there. Uh, I should also note that, that the population issue is 
is uh, never been a concern of the DNR. The DNR had shotgun zones in the state of Minnesota for deer management and deer management only. It's never been because uh, they were less lethal than, than rifles. Um, I could get Senator Howe up, and he may get up and talk about that, but, but uh, the guns now that, that are, are able to be shot in shotgun zones really are really no different than rifles. Uh, they have this very good philosophy, uh, velocity, and, and uh, they're, they're very, you know, very scientific. And I mean, we've got tremendous weapons out there now that, that uh, can take these animals and take them in a good, clean way. Uh, so that, that removes that language. It, it, it's the language from Dodge and, and uh, Olmstead County. The, the, the amendment also removes the wolf language, knowing that people are very passionate about that. And again, uh, we're not able to, we're not able to uh, uh, move on that until they come off the list. So once they come off the endangered list, I'm, I'm guessing that this legislature uh, we'll be then addressing the wolf hunt, and at that point in time, uh, you can decide, as we did in the past, to uh, vote for that or, or, or not. So that removes that. And the mattress recycling, it removes that section of the bill. Uh, there needs to be a lot of work on that. Uh, so that has been taken out. Those three different, two items taken out and one actually carve out for, for one, uh, two counties that are concerned about the uh, rifle hunt. But otherwise, the rifle hunt would, would still still continue, the language will still continue to move forward to all the rest of the counties. So I ask for your support, uh, members, on this amendment, the A-54. Discussion of the A-54 amendment. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, just to be clear, I'm, I'm reading the amendment, so I would have a question for Senator Ingebrigtsen. He will yield, Senator Dibble. Our, um, I'm looking at Senator Ingebrigtsen, I'm just trying to understand, first of all, how to read the amendment. I'm looking at lines 1.30 to 2.3. Um, we're inserting repealers there. Mr. President, Senator Ingebrigtsen, is that correct? I see three repealers, A, B, C. These would be new repealers, correct? We're not removing repealers from the bill. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Okay, this is a, uh, with staff here, thank you. Um, this is a special way of, of uh, the repealing this particular section of law according to our staff that has to be done with regards to the incident to the uh, to the three issues that are involved in the uh, amendment senator dibble so so mr president senator ingebrigtsen um just just to restate my question because i don't quite understand the response i for example i looked up one of the repealers um, so it's a repealer to 97C.515, which has to do with minnows. Does this amendment repeal subdivision 5 and subdivision 6, or excuse me, subdivision 4 and subdivision 5 from that statute? Or does this amendment remove the repeal from your underlying bill? It, it, it Senator makes no changes. It makes no changes. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll just uh, go on faith, Mr. President. Thank you. Further discussion of the A54 amendment. Uh, Senator D uh, Dietzik. I'm, um, thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to follow up on Senator Dibble's, Dibble's question on the repealer. So I'm looking on page 81, and I'm looking at the amendment. And so on line 131 of the amendment, it says Minnesota statute section, Minnesota statute 2020 section 97C 515. And so, our, so on line 8125, are we just repealing Minnesota statutes 2020 sections 97B 318? Because it looks like the rest of 
you know, line 131 to 2.3 is still in the bill. I believe that's question for Senator Igerbretson. And I might sit down and talk to um, council staff, and then I'll come back if I have more questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I have an amendment to the amendment. It's the A57. The Secretary will report the A57 amendment to the amendment. Senator Eichhorn moves to amend the A54 amendment to Senate file number 4062 as follows. Page 1, delete line 27. This is the A57 amendment. To the A57 amendment, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. President. And this uh, amendment to the amendment, uh, the only thing it touches is the wolf hunt provision. It stops the amendment that Senator Ingebrigtsen offered from removing the wolf provision from the bill. It would keep it in. The rest of the amendment would stay the same. Uh, in Greater Minnesota, this is one of the, the biggest things uh, I and other members hear about in our districts. It's become a great problem. I realize that uh, adding this back in isn't going to force a wolf hunt immediately, but when the wolf does get delisted, the DNR should be ready and prepared, and that's all this does. It doesn't touch the endangered species list. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen did a great job explaining what the bill would do if the wolf provision stayed in, and so what this amendment would do is just keep the wolf provision in the underlying bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm just going to take a, just a brief pause as we wait until the amendment comes up on the screen. Senator Marty is saying he does not have it on his screen yet. Should be there now. Senator Marty gives us the thumbs up. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment, the A57. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I oppose this amendment, and um, the reason that the wolf is back on the uh, endangered list is because they're being um, killed as it is quite indiscriminately, and the, the death of different members of the pack makes a big difference in the um, hierarchy and their survival. I also um, want to respect the Anishinaabe people who and their uh, reverence for the wolf and believe that this bill takes away the um, DNR's rights to decide when we need to hunt the wolf and mandates a hunt. So I also ask for roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call is granted. Senator Herr. Mr. President, I also arise in a post of the amendment. I know uh, as we began, I think there was good reason that we uh, decided to take this out. You know, I mean, I, I don't represent the northern area, but I represent as a state senator elected by uh, the metro area, East High St. Paul. Um, I heard from my constituents, especially uh, those from the native community, to regard their, their sacred animal as, as the highest uh, being, and that's where I stand for. I'm a hunter myself, but you know, uh, the, would we shoot a loon? When loon is our state birds, would we shoot an eagle? And the wolf, to me and to the Anishinaabe people, has the same regard, and so, you know, I, 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 I would, maybe I would uh, yell and ask uh, Sen Senator Eichhorn. Uh, Senator I would Eichhorn. Ask, I would ask, yep, ask Senator Eichhorn to yell. Senator, Senator Eichhorn, Eichhorn, have you talked to, uh, Senator Eichhorn, have you talked to your native community up there, uh, whether they support, uh, you know, hunting of uh, our gray wolves? Not as of this Senator year. Senator Mr. President. Uh, not as of this year, but I have talked with them before. Uh, the leadership of the band, I don't believe, supports the bill, but many of their membership actually do. So I have had conversations with folks in my district. This is strongly supported. This is one of the number one things people talk to me about in my district. I can't go to Home Depot or the grocery store or Anytime Fitness without somebody asking me about the wolf hunt. Senator Herb. Thank you, Senator Icon. And as I know, it's also a concern for farmer, but there is uh, money that, that will be paid back to um, uh, any cattle that's been attacked by wolves, so there's not much concern there if there's uh, um, a cattle have been harmed, but I, my highest regard is toward the Anishinaabe culture and also the native community, and it seemed like 
um, Senator Icon has not really um, communicate to the leadership of the Anishinaabe and uh, the Ojibwe people and the native people of our community. So I stand firm in telling my colleagues uh, to oppose uh, the amendment. And, and if roll call has not been said, I want to echo roll call as well. Okay. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would also stand in opposition to this amendment. Um, Mr. President, members, um, for the reasons that have already been our stated and articulated by Senators Eaton and her, um, but also uh, to just uh, express the plain and simple fact that there is no environmental or ecological reason to have an open season on wolves. And in fact, quite the opposite is the case. Wolves provide an essential part of our overall ecosystem. Uh, they perform many, many vital functions that are a benefit to a lot of the constituencies and people we care about uh, in the area of, of uh, CWD, for example, and, you know, and uh, the, the issue of, of controlling deer herds. Um, on, and on that subject, uh, you know, making sure that it even goes so far as to ensure that our wetlands are protected. When you get overrun with deer and you don't have natural predators and the amount of voracious consumption of trees and the like um, that occurs with, with an imbalance in our ecosystem. Members, there are very, very few wolves left in North America compared to what there used to be, and, and our ecosystem is completely out of balance. Senator Hur talked about the provisions we have to protect those legitimate concerns, um, but the research shows that, uh, that there is no underlying environmental or ecological research that shows there's any benefit and there's a lot of consequence and a lot of downside to opening up on season on wolves. And we've seen in some western states where they've simply lifted the lid, um, they've reduced the number of wolves in their states, once again back to near zero, which is a real tragedy. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Senator Bach. Well, uh Thank you, Mr. President. I, I didn't really mean to speak on this until I heard Senator Dibble say there's really no reason that we should manage the wolf population. S Senator Dibble, I just have to tell you, that's not true. Uh, they're, they're, the wolf is at the top of the food chain, and it's a species that, whose population has to be managed to protect the other species below them. And the classic example in my district is the iconic moose. And a whole lot of us in this room would love to see a moose someday on a, on, a, on a road in northern Minnesota. But what has happened to the moose population, and I was one of the lucky ones who was able to draw a ticket back when we had a season for hunting moose in Minnesota, uh, back in the 90s. Uh, what happened is in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s, the wolf population was brought way down by, by wolf management. And what happened as a result of that is the moose population in Minnesota who had almost disappeared because they don't uh, habitate well with, with white-tailed deer, Be when the predator population came down, the moose population started to go up. And in 1971, Minnesota had its very first moose season. And through the 70s and the 80s, the DNR had a lottery and, and, and Successful applicants were able to hunt a moose, and the success rate was in the high 80s, low 90 percent range, and people had a great opportunity to, to, to experience that, and I was fortunate to be one of them. And what happened over time is when the federal government put the wolf on the endangered species list and there was no control of it, that population of wolves exploded. And guess what happened? The moose population went like this. And in 1997, the DNR had to close the moose season because there weren't enough moose left and they were worried about the future of uh, the population of wolves. It just ebbs and flows. And this legislature spent money to try and study what has been happening to the moose population in the state. In fact, I think we spent about a million dollars. Uh, and the DNR worked with the, tr the tr tribes in northern Minnesota, and they collared uh, cow wolves to figure out 
Why are we getting no production? Why is the population of wolves not coming, or of deer, of moose not coming back even when we don't have a season? Why, why is the moose population not coming back? And what they learned when they radio collared cow moose, and then what they found is that two thirds of the moose calves that were born, two thirds of the moose calves that were born were being eaten by wolves and bears. So there is, there, that moose population is never going to come back. We don't get some control over the predator population. And we do what we can try to do through a lottery system to control the bear population, but we do nothing on the wolf population. And, and it's, it's just, you can call it hunting if you want, but it's, it's, it's a game animal, and it's a management of the species at the top of the food chain, and it simply has to be managed. Just like we manage deer so that you don't hit one with your car every day when you drive out the, the, the driveway, in order to, nature went all out of balance when, when Homo sapiens came into the equation. And we have disrupted the entire balance of nature and now we do things to try keep things in balance. And the wolf is one of those animals that has to be managed so that we have sustainable populations of other species. It, it's just that simple. And you can see there's, there's been a lot of work done on Isle Royal about the, the interaction between wolves and moose. It's just a predator-prey relationship, and you have to manage the numbers. So I think Senator Eichhorn is right. You know, they're on the endangered species list. This isn't going to trigger a, 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 a wolf-taking season, but it's going to provide the opportunity of, of, to DNR to initiate a season again once they come off the federal uh, endangered species list, and it's just an, a, an animal that we have to, have to be able to manage. So I don't want anybody to think that all of a sudden there's going to be a wolf hunting season be, just because the Icorn Amendment might pass, because that's just not true. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I rise in strong support of Senator Hur's amendment. There, excuse me. Um, I thought it was Senator Herr's amendment, and I will come back. So just so we know, we're on the A57 amendment, which is the delete of the repeal of the wolf uh, population management. Uh, Senator Eichhorn, you want to re-explain it just so the body knows the A57 amendment? Yes, Mr. President, thank you. I can re-explain it and just give one more comment before I think Senator Engerbritsen was on your list too before we head to him for comment on the underlying amendment. But what the A57 will do is change Senator Engerbritsen's A54 amendment to uh, just put the wolf hunt back into the bill. It won't remove that. It would leave the, the mattress provision still being removed and the Sorry, I forgot what it was, the other provision also taken out. So that's what it does, puts the wolf hunt provision back in the bill. As the discussion was going on, I actually, uh, a after Senator Hur's question, received a, a text message from a constituent who actually is a tribal member, and the, the comment said, you know, nobody cares about hunting the gray wolf, it's the timber wolf, so that's a different story that's sacred to them. So um, there's a lot of folks that do believe this is a necessity. Um, the wolf population, as Senator Bach alluded to, has gotten out of control in northern Minnesota. If somebody wants to have a discussion, maybe, maybe you know, if, if you want to move some of the wolf to the metro area, maybe we can bring some of them down here and you guys can enjoy them as much as we do, but the wolf is becoming a problem. I, I find it a little odd to think that we say, well, it's okay, there's not a problem, we can just pay farmers and people who have their livestock killed. People in greater Minnesota can't be bought off that easy, and even if you're paying them, it's still a problem. People don't want to have their livestock killed, it's a problem, and the current management plan in Minnesota for the wolf is shoot, shovel, shut up, and that's a terrible management plan. It's not good for the wolf, and it's not good for the people of Minnesota. So we need to have this in place so the DNR can be ready to go when the wolf is delisted once again. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to clarify or clear up a few um, erroneous statements. Um, number one, the reason that the uh, wolf population is decreasing has multiple causes. The causes are climate change, the increase in parasites, the increase in um, deer has transferred many diseases to the moose, and um, it does, you know, of course, the wolf do eat some, but the, um, 
the uh, the uh, moose is um, the, the increase in higher temperatures is the main reason for the moose uh, decreasing. And the uh, wolf population is managed by its own uh, packs. They, they, they have so many in a pack and someone, one of them dies, then they're, they're replaced through their process. It's a family um, with the two, uh, uh, alphas, and uh, we don't need to be indiscriminately uh, destroying members of the pack. The, then they end up with the teenagers in the pack, uh, unable to be led by anybody who knows what's going on, and that's when they go in and they start um, uh, attacking cattle and such. So I strongly oppose this amendment. Senator Herr. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to ask Senator Icon to, to yield. He will yield, Senator Herr. Uh, Senator Icon and members, I, because this amendment up here just on the laptop and I don't see the full language, you know, mainly just delete some line here and there, but I just want to hear from you is, is the language still say shall or is it may on on the amendment that you uh, proposed. Senator Eichhorn. Mr. President, uh, Senator Herr, the amendment uh, is five lines and it simply just adds the hunt back into the bill. Uh, Senator Herr. Is this, uh, is this, is this the same lang language as um, the original uh, language of the open season. Um, uh, Senator Eichhorn. Mr. President, Senator Herr, it's the same language as the underlying bill, yes. Okay. Mr. Mr. Pre Mr. President, I do have major concern and I'm still strong in opposing it, mainly because uh, this hand tied to DNR in, in must do it. You know, we we should get the um, the DNR some flexibility to manage the wolf population. If we truly want to manage, manage is is meaning apply skillful man management. Cannot be open uh, for regular hunter, novice, novice hunter, because a wolf pack depend on leadership structure. If you end up killing the alpha male, or the alpha female, that break up the wolf, wolf pack and then it intensify the attack of wolves because they're getting hungry and they lose leadership structure. That's one of the uh, uh, important element in the pack structure. So I'm still in strong oppose unless um, the, the uh, author of the amendment change that to May or um, other. Uh, I would not do so because I, I don't support this amendment and I don't support the, I may not support the bill in general, so, um, but I want to say that we want to give the DNR a little leeway to properly manage this if this are going to move forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, members, just as a point of clarification, the amendment that, the, the amendment to the amendment that's being requ requested by Senator Eichhorn focuses on lines in the original bill on line, page 28, lines three through eight, that would leave those lines in the bill. Senate, the underlying original amendment would delete on page 28, lines three through eight. So the ICORN amendment simply keeps every word in that section in the same place. So if you are interested, I would suggest you go online and look at light, page 28, lines three through eight. Next on my list is Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to address a couple of things that have been talked about. Uh, first one would be, you know, we have a fund to deal with cattle loss or sheep or whatever, the depredation fund. In order to get that money, you have to have a conservation officer come and confirm 
that it was a wolf kill. Well, if they eat the entire carcass or there's nothing left, they cannot make that confirmation. Less than 20% of cattle or sheep that are lost actually get that determination, and we deplete that fund to zero every year anyway. So our farmers are not being made whole through that depredation fund. Another comment that was made is it is the rising temperatures that is causing the decline in the moose population. Well, I find it interesting that over in Maine, which is further south than northern Minnesota, their moose population is thriving. And two years ago, when we went out to our hunting land, which is in the Hinkley area, there were two moose that had come to that area. They went south, they didn't go north. So I find it difficult to believe that it is rising temperatures that is causing the decline in the moose population. Senator Bach referred to a study a while ago. I read one that was done probably 10, 12 years ago where in the spring they did a flyover and found that 90% of the females had a calf at their side. In the fall, when they did the flyover, less than 10% had a calf at their side. I don't know about you, but I have wolves in my very own backyard, and I also witnessed wolves chasing a moose and her calf into a lake up in northern Minnesota. They were after that calf. The calf is the most vulnerable, and the wolves are the ones who are killing all the moose calves, and their population will never recover if those calves do not have an opportunity to survive. And I'll, I find it interesting, when I was in the other body, uh, many of you might remember the issue around uh, stocking of muskies. Well, I brought an amendment for fun in the other body to say, well, let's stock timber wolves in the Twin City metro area. And it generated the exact response I wanted. Three members from the suburbs got up and said, you know, we have small animals in the suburbs. And the wolves would kill our small animals. Guess what, in rural Minnesota, we have small animals too. And I've heard from many people that say at night they cannot put their dogs or the cats or any other pets outside. The wolves are right at their back door. Members, we are not asking to wipe the timber wolf out of Minnesota. We're asking to be able to manage their population just like we do with the deer, just like we do with bear, just like we used to do with moose. I, I just find it unbelievable that people will say, I don't want it in my backyard, but you get to have it there, and we're not going to allow you to do anything to control that population. Members, that's all we're asking. And I think we do hear a lot of people that say, if you're not going to allow us to control their population, you're just leaving us with no other recourse but to protect our livestock and our animals and that's not what people want to do. But you're not leaving them any other choice when you just flat out say no, and you will not engage in how we can help manage and control this population. That's exactly what the DNR wants to do. That's exactly what this amendment is going to say. Let's allow the DNR to manage the population when the wolf gets delisted. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Ingebretson yield for a quick question? He will yield, Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And Senator Ingebretson, I'm just looking at the underlying bill, and it looks like we strike out on line 28.6 uh, May, and the Icorn Amendment would put in must annually. My question, and, and I think Senator Rarick just brought it up, is there anything today that prevents the commissioner from creating an, a, a wolf hunt season under current law? Senator Ingebretson. Uh, no, I don't believe there is. Uh, however, uh, as you can see with the conversation that we've had, it becomes controversial. 
So um, my guess would be that if and when they come off the endangered species list, there will be members in this body and others as well that will say, uh, we don't want to be able to hunt. And at that time, that conversation would go on. But if nobody stood in the way, the DNR could manage that animal just like anything else. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My, my concern with the ICORN amendment is the insertion of must annually prescribe versus allowing the DNR to use the science to manage the uh, wolf population. I don't think there's any argument that the wolf population needs to be managed, and we want to have a vibrant uh, uh, deer hunt, moose hunt, uh, all of these seasons that our sportsmen so enjoy and bring in, our, bring in tourists. I just don't want to put a mandate onto the DNR um, that w could stay in statute for decades to come. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bach. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And just briefly to Senator Pratt's comment, <clears throat> the, the wolf management system that the DNR conducted a few years ago when they had a season was a lottery. And they will manage the population depending on what the overall management goal is. So some years there will be more tags available in the lottery. Some years there will be less. Uh, Senator Pratt, I mean, the DNR could decide they're only going to give out one tag in a year, depending on what the population is doing. But so I think the DNR has the flexibility to adjust the, the, the number of tags that are issued. But that's not the real reason I got up, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. President, because I, I just have to respond to Senator Eaton's comment about climate change. And I realize that's real popular when something's not going your way to say that it's about climate change. But that is absolutely not true as it relates to the moose population in northern Minnesota. It's just not true, and people should quit saying it. There is plenty of science that shows it's not about climate change. All you have to do is go look at Isle Royal. I mean, the federal government has spent a lot of money over there for decades studying the predator-prey relationship between the moose and the timber wolf. And what they have learned is obvious. It's not about temperature. The wolf, the wolf population exploded because the moose population was high. And members, what happened there in the very recent past is the moose, or the, the wolves ate all the moose. And there were no moose left on Isle Royale. And guess what happened? The wolves went away because there was nothing to eat. And the wolves were exterminated from Isle Royale on their own because there was nothing for them to eat. There were zero wolves left a few years ago, and the federal government decided to transplant some from northern Michigan, I believe. They died because they didn't, uh, for whatever reason. Then I think they tried some Canadian ones trying to reestablish a, a wolf population on Isle Royale. Do you know why they wanted a wolf population on Isle Royale? Because when the wolves all died off, the moose population exploded to like 12 to 1,500 moose on that island. Now, that population would not have exploded like that if this was about climate change. It's just not true to say it's about climate change and temperature. Otherwise, why would the moose population have come back to extraordinary numbers so high that they were ravaging uh, all of the landscape on the island and the federal government decided we have to take this moose population down or they're all going to starve to death because there'll be nothing left for them to eat on the island. So it, it's just not true that climate change is the factor that's impacting the, the moose population in Minnesota. There is no science that supports that. Now what there is science for is the work that this legislature appropriated that the DNR conducted along with the tribes that said that the wolves and the bears are eating two-thirds of the moose calves. That's just a fact. That's just a fact, but I would appreciate it if people would, would quit using things that are conveniently popular as a reason to support their case, because it's just not true that climate change is impacting the wolf's population. There is no data that supports that. Senator McEwen. 
Thank you very much. I rise um, in opposition to the, the ICORN amendment, and I just want to um, note today, it's really something <laughs> to hear so many people who have such certitude as if they are practicing scientists about what the science says or doesn't say. I do agree with a comment that has already been made, and that is that I want to bring our attention back to the language of this provision. If, in fact, what we're doing here is we are requiring the DNR to have a hunt, that is what the language would do for the amendment. It would require our agency, supersede our scientists from making good decisions based on the actual science, not just waxing on as um, we do here in this body. So um, the DNR can hold a wolf, wolf hunt, and let's just let them do their jobs, okay? Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, members, for a spirited debate. I'm going to be a no on the amendment. I agree with the comments about must and shall, and I want to thank Senator Herr for pointing that out. I'd also just say uh, to the amendment, to the question of moose mortality, I would love to see the Minnesota Senate hold a hearing on the effects of climate change on wildlife in northern Minnesota. I believe the moose are all but extinct in northwestern Minnesota and down 90% in northeastern Minnesota, and I believe the science shows that the increased heat of a few degrees places greater stress on them, and I would love to see the Minnesota Senate hold a hearing with witnesses allowed on both sides of that issue, including scientists, so we could see how it sounds. I think that's something the people of Minnesota want us to do, Mr. President, say, well, let's Let's put the evidence out there and let's see how it sounds. To the amendment, to the amendment, Mr. President, I urge members to vote no. Thank you. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I would just like to list um, a few studies from Scientific American, the University of New Hampshire, Idaho State, Vermont, Manitoba, that all state that um, climate change and the increasing temperatures in northern part of the country are one of the main reasons for the decrease in the moose population. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment A57. Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes no. Champion votes no. Senator Friends. I report Senator Clausen votes no. Clausen votes no. Senator Friends. I report Senator Kent votes no. Kent votes no. Senator Friends. I report Senator Newton votes no. Newton votes no. Senator Friends. I report Senator Franzen votes no. Franzen votes no. Lucas and Franzen votes no. Senator Friends. And I report Senator... Port votes no. Port votes no. Call on Senator Duckworth to report members voting, voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes yes. Anderson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes yes. Benson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes yes. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes yes. Johnson votes aye. Senator, jo uh, Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes yes. Miller votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes yes. Rosen votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes yes. Thomasoni votes aye.
is fooling me. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 28 ayes and 37 nays, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> to the original amendment in front of us members, the A54 amendment, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thought I would just, um, in case, in case there's any members of the public just hanging by their fingernails wondering what the answer to the repealer question is, I'm sure many are. I now understand how it works. So in the amendment, um, this, there's a group of repealers which are um, in the underlying bill, but for one of the repealers which has been removed in the amendment. So that's the repealer that's being taken out of the bill. The rest of them remain in the bill because they're already there and they're there in the amendment. So that's how it works. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion to the A54 amendment. There being seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A54 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? The motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. Further discussion? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Mr. President, I do have the <coughs> A44 amendment. The Secretary will report the A44 amendment. Senator Ingebrigtsen moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows. Page 28 after line 8, insert. This is the A44 amendment. To the A44 amendment, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Um, Mr. President, members, uh, this is a, a bill that just came forward. Um, it actually did not get a, a hearing in the, uh, in, in the Environment uh, Policy Committee. However, it's something that I think needed to be addressed. And, and uh, so I said I would bring it forward. And what it does, it's regards to beaver dam removals in the state of Minnesota. Um, and the amendment addresses the, a constituent issue regarding the removal of a beaver dam uh, on an outlet to their lake that property owners believe was taken out improperly. A private property owner not on the lake removed the beaver dam that is on his private property but located on a public water. The DNR Constituents and Senate Council have been conflicting views on over current beaver dam removal statute 97B.665 should be uh, interrupted. DNR believes that because the dam is located on private property, it can be removed without a permit, but constituents on the other end of the lake that are affected by that removal, uh, both sides, and in this particular case, both coming from one lake into another, uh, we feel that they should have to go to the DNR to get a permit to do that. Now, there's a lot of dam removal members, beaver dam removal going on in, in uh, the state of Minnesota. Uh, and I don't believe, in fact, I think counties and townships do a lot of that. They, uh, they actually pay for that. And that's because of water backup and it and affects the crops and, and whatnot. Um, but they just have just, just basically a carte blanche permit, I think, to, to do that. So uh, this amendment uh, does not remove the property owner's rights to remove a beaver dam that is located on his property, only states that the property owner must obtain a public water beaver dam removal permit before removing a dam that is located on public waters. This amendment is looking to protect the public waters by ensuring that work under the public water work in the public water is done properly without damaging the public waters where it is located. This does not impact the DNR changes to the beaver dam removal statute in 2018 that was done to allow counties to quickly address removal of beaver dams and ditches that I just talked about. So members, I, I, think, it's, I think it's just good common sense that 
that those that are in charge of the water, which is the DNR, uh, we put them in charge of, of managing our water, that they be, uh, they be uh, asked to uh, give a person that owns private property uh, uh, where there's other people that own private property, at least the opportunity to, to uh, have to have the DNR come and look at it to see what the effects of removing this beaver dam is going to be. And if it's too much of a uh, negative effect on other property owners, I think the DNR should have the right to say, no, you'll have to not, you won't be able to remove the beaver dam. That's what this basically does, members. I'll stand for any questions. To the A44 dam amendment, any discussion? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Um, it is uh, hard to do committee work on the floor. Um, this is a new idea, a new bill. Um, I'm not completely opposed to it, and I hope uh, when I offer my brilliant amendments and future bills, we will uh, think about you know, how smart uh, these ideas are when they come on the floor. But that being said, Mr. President, uh, just a quick question if Senator Ingebrigtsen will yield. He will yield, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President and uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. This seems like a good idea. Actually, I was quite sincere. I wasn't being entirely uh, uh, sarcastic in that comment. Um, but do we have any response or reaction from the DNR, uh, whom you cited? Um, do they agree that this is a good idea? And do we know whether or not this has a fiscal impact? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Uh, um, of course, first of all, all the amendments that I offer are going to be science-based. You know that, Senator Dibble. We've always we've always gone through this every year. <laughs> but I respect your uh, your uh, your comments, uh, obviously, and, and uh, would say that uh, you're very very involved in the uh, committee, and I appreciate that. Um, the DNR uh, has been has been talked to about this. Uh, and they, uh, they believe that uh, because the dam is located on private property, it can be removed without a permit, but constituents on the lake contend that because the dam is on public water, a permit should have been required. I think, I think basically what the, what the DNR is saying, that, uh, that if it's, it's on public water, if it's on private water, you go ahead and do it. And that's where it's being done an awful lot. Uh, counties and townships are doing that. But if it's going to affect the lakeshore level on one end of the lake versus the other end of the lake, uh, and it's a public stream that runs through there, and that's owned by the public, that's owned by you and I, they should simply have to go to, to DNR and get a permit. And I don't think that's unreasonable. Further discussion? Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Ingebrigtsen yield? Senator Ingebrigtsen will yield. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebrigtsen, I, I couldn't quite hear you. Um, was this a bill um, that just didn't get a hearing, or was this a, just a late idea? And, and again, I agree with Senator Dibble that I don't necessarily disagree with the idea. I'm just trying to figure out if it was an actual bill. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for that question. No, it is just a late idea. There was no bill. I'm sorry. If I said that before, I didn't mean, I don't mean that. It was not a actual bill. It just came to, uh, to my attention uh, within the last uh, period, like a lot of these things that, that do happen. So if you think it's unreasonable, members, uh, uh, you know, vote, vote, your, vote your conscience on this. But uh, I think being as public waters, I, 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 I simply wouldn't be bringing it to you if it was on private property. I would not do that. But if it's going to affect everybody else's property, uh, I think it needs, it certainly needs a look at. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, Senator Newman. My apologies, Mr. President, but um, I'm not at all sure that this is a real good idea. I'm sitting here trying to figure out how a beaver dam would be exclusively located on public water. Uh, it's almost axiomatic that the, that the beaver dam is going to have to be somehow attached to, uh, to land. And what con is of concern to me is that the, the amendment uh, is directed to a beaver dam located specifically on public waters. And I just have the feeling that there's a property rights issue here uh, whereby 
someone who owns private property, and through that private property flows public water that we are now conferring on the DNR additional authority to determine whether or not that beaver dam uh, is going to be controlled through the permitting process. And so my, my concern is, I, uh, is, is, number one, I think it's a property right that is being affected. And number two, I don't know how the DNR is going to have a beaver dam that would be located exclusively on public water. Could be on public water attached to public land or public water attached to private land. But I don't think you could have a beaver dam exclusively in the water. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion, and thank you for that, Senator. Uh, I don't think there's going to be, first of all, any beaver dams that aren't in the water. Let's make that clear. Um, however, and I understand your, your, your personal property rights. I understand that. And I think what the DNR has always said, and we've heard this time and again, those that have been on the committee, that we don't want to get into Western water rights, which is um, when you get out in the Western part of the country, not the state of Minnesota, but out, out West, if you actually own property alongside of the water that runs through it, you actually own that water. You actually own access to that water, and you can do it as you like. Uh, Minnesota does not have that. Uh, I understand your concern that if it's only private property that's being, that's being uh, um, uh, dealt with here, or that's being subjected to this beaver dam, that would be fine. That would be one thing. But there's several, several people, in fact, one whole lake of, of residents that it's affecting. And that beaver dam happens to be in a creek that runs between two, uh, two lakes. And yes, the person that removed it actually ha has property on both sides. However, he went in there with a backhoe and, and, and removed it. And again, that, that in itself is, is uh, um, you know, I mean, that in itself creates a lot of issues downstream too. So. Again, members, uh, it just came to me, and, and uh, if, if, if it's the will of the body to, for it to do some more work, uh, but I, I think it's pretty straightforward, and I think the DNR can certainly work with this, and uh, if it's something that they really, really have heartburn over, which they don't, uh, we, can, we can deal with it in conference committee. Senator Root. Will Senator Ingebrigtsen yield for your question? He will. Senator Root. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I heard you talk about a landowner with a backhoe. Is this like a personal uh, issue? This happened to somebody and you're doing it for this someone um, on a specific property? Or th is this a state policy? Because I've, it didn't come through the committee, obviously, but I'm just wondering if this is done for a specific person. You kind of indicated that to be so. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. President and, and Senator for that question. And uh, that's certainly a very, very, obviously a very good question, but that's exactly how things come to us from constituents. Uh, constituents bring issues to it. And I, I've been around long enough to know that you just can't respond to everybody that, that comes through the door with their one particular issue. But it was explained to me that many people uh, that are going to be affected by this, uh, other lake lakeshore owners are going to be affected by this, now, as a legislator, my ears perk up a little bit. I should pay attention to it. Uh, so it is not one individual. One individual brought it forward, I guess, that had the, um, I don't know if, the, if she was uh, the organizer of the group to come forward. I don't know. But sometimes that happens. They don't have a, a, a lake association. I'm not sure if they even have a lake association. A lot of times, they bring them these issues forward. Um, but this was brought forward by one individual who I think uh, is not only concerned about their property, but other property on both sides of that beaver dam. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A44 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The no motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. Division, Division has been called.
All those in favour of the amendment, signify by, or signify by standing up, please. Thank you, members. All those against the A44 amendment, please stand. Thank you, members. For the second day in a row, my, my ears need to be checked. The, the amendment does not prevail. Further discussion? Senator Bach. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A50 amendment. Secretary will report the A50 amendment. Senator Bach moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 75 after line 3, insert. This is the A50 amendment. Senator Bach. Well, uh, Mr. President, way back in 2011, well, well let me back up even further. The issue of, of wild rice uh, and point discharges from municipal plants or industrial permits has been around for a long time. Uh, and and back in 2000, back in 1990, 1973, the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, based on some observational data, put a wild rice standard of 10 milligrams per liter for any discharge into, into their rulemaking. Uh, in 1977, the federal government, the federal EPA, approved that rule. So that has been on the books since 1977 that any new permit has to have uh, the 10 milliliter standard for, wild, uh, for sulfate coming out of the discharge. It was never ever enforced until all of a sudden in 2010 uh, the Pollution Control Agency decided to enforce that standard. But it's not currently in any of the permits that have been issued uh, since 1977. And uh, the it affects a whole lot of municipalities. I've got a list here of over 60 municipalities that, whose wastewater discharges ultimately end up in a body of water that sometime in the past mostly had wild rice in them. And uh, so it affects municipalities all the way from Big Fork and Babbitt and Biwabic in the north. It, it affects five discharges in the Metropolitan Council's area. It affects uh, down to Winona and Houston. I mean, it's, it's really all across the state. And that's why the legislature wanted to deal with this issue, because uh, every, most people felt that it was kind of an arbitrary standard, but the federal government had signed off on it. So the legislature appropriated about, a, if I remember right, about a million dollars to have some science done. We had the University of Minnesota spend a couple years trying to figure out if the 10 standard is not the right number, what is the right number? And, and the University of Minnesota didn't actually come with a new number. And just a reminder, the drinking water standard for sulfates is 250 milligrams per liter. And so what, what the University of Minnesota did come with is some research that said, well, it depends on what the water chemistry is of the water that you're discharging into. And if there's iron in that water, it's much less likely for the sulfates to turn into sulfides, which have an impact on wild rice growth. And it also depended on what the, under the bed of the water body was and its ability to absorb the sulfates and not become sulfides. So the Pollution Control Agency then, after getting that uh, data from the research from the University of Minnesota in 2015, went into the rulemaking process. And the legislature put a provision in law that said, well, until we get this whole thing resolved, the PCA can't enforce the state standard. So we got the research. Uh, the, the PCA went through the rulemaking process. And then by 2018, they abandoned the rulemaking process because it was so complicated. The administrative law judge, they thought, was going to throw out the rulemaking because the the process to evaluate what all of these different water bodies are all across the state and the impact on, uh, on discharges was just way too complicated. So the 
PCA couldn't quite figure out how to implement a rule, so they withdrew it from consideration by the administrative law judge. Well, what's happened since then, the law is still on the books that says that the Pollution Control Agency cannot enforce the 10 standard that's in law. But just in the last couple months, a letter came from Region 5 of the EPA, and the, the EPA position is that the Minnesota legislature has no authority to uh, say that the PCA can endorse that 10 milliliter standard. And that's because the, the federal EPA, I told you, in 1977, decided to accept Minnesota's standard of 10. So then it became a federal standard at the EPA. The EPA just two months ago came and said, you, the legislature can't override a federal standard. But what the, what, the, what the EPA did say, they acknowledged there's a problem by saying in their letter, uh, to this end, based on that whole subject, uh, the EPA urges the MPCA to work with state lawmakers in resolving this matter. So this is an issue that needs to be resolved or we're going to have some tremendous impacts not only on industrial permitting but on municipal wastewater discharges all across the state. So all my amendment does, sorry for the long narrative, but the, the provision in law relative to the rulemaking that PCA was going through said they had to complete their rulemaking by 2019. Well, they didn't because they withdrew the rule. They didn't do anything because uh, they couldn't implement the 10 standard, but now we're in a situation where they need to re-enter the rulemaking. So all the amendment does is changes the date in law when they have to complete the rulemaking from 2019 to 2025. So members, that's all it does. It just changes when the rulemaking has to be completed from 2019 in current law to 2025. There's no other change to anything. Just, uh, they still have, they have to, the, the law is a little bit in conflict because the law says they have to go into rulemaking to develop a standard, and then it had to be done by 19, which clearly can't be done. So uh, it just, uh, they have to go into rulemaking according to current law. This just moves the date that they have to be done by to 2025. Appreciate your support. To the A50 amendment, Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, Senator Bach has, has very well outlined uh, the, the purpose of this bill and the history of it, and I simply want to stand up and support the, uh, the A50 amendment. I remember a few years ago uh, dealing with Senator Tomasoni uh, on this issue, and, and as I recall, it, it affected, uh, this issue affected a number of the cities within his district. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so I just want members to know that I do support the A50. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, members, um, I just wanted to, um, just for the benefit of the public, um, let them know what we're voting on here, um, because I, I don't think that's entirely clear. So what Senator Bach is proposing um, is that we move back a, a rulemaking that, was, that is required in order to protect you know, the very sensitive wild rice and that grows in northern Minnesota. It's very sensitive uh, to water chemistry. Uh, and we've seen a, a huge diminishment of wild rice. Minnesota has some of the most uh, amazing naturally occurring wild rice stands in the entire world, and uh, we're losing that wild rice fairly quickly um, for a variety of reasons, some of which are related to discharge that comes from industrial, the industrial sector. And so the law that's, that's being amended says that the PCA um, is required to um, amend rules you know, for the purpose of protecting uh, wild rice uh, and until that occurs, that uh, the agency shall not require anyone with a pollution permit to expend money for design or implementation of sulfate treatment technologies or other forms of sulfate mitigation. Um, it can require minimizing sulfate, but can't require them to expend any, any resources for so doing. 
and cannot list waters containing natural beds of wild rice as impaired for sulfate. And, um, and, it, and it says until you know, the rulemaking is completed, which the deadline was 2019, now we'll be moving that back to 2025. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to uh, ask Senator Bach to yield for a quick question. He will yield, Senator Dibble. Uh, Senator Bach, um, similar to um, our questions of the last amendment, uh, is, is this a late breaker? Um, you know, an idea that's coming forward kind of after we've been through the committee process. Did we, did we have any committee hearings? Was this introduced as a bill? Was this deliberated through the regular deliberative legislative process? Senator Bach. Well, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. President. S Senator Dibble, uh, the, the letter came from EPA over to the PCA in late February. I've got a copy of it here. I'd be happy to share it with you. I didn't actually get the letter. Uh, and everyone was trying to evaluate kind of how are we going to respond to this, including the PCA. Uh, I didn't get it until about three weeks ago, probably. So the committee, uh, the opportunity to introduce a bill and move it through uh, was, was passed. Uh, but the, the, the crux of it is we cannot, the session law that we passed that says we have to, the, the PCA cannot implement the standard uh, has been ruled null and void by the EPA. So the PCA is going to ha either going to have to enforce, enforce the 10 standard or they're going to have to go into the rulemaking process and, and look to amend the rule. One of those two things is going to have to happen. And I think we, we all should want to find out, can we find some rulemaking that is more flexible uh, and that's what that whole rulemaking process is going to be about. So this doesn't change the standard, it just tells them that they have to go back into the rulemaking. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. Um, if, if Senator Bach would, nah, never mind. I'm not going to ask that question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'll just uh, simply ask for a roll call vote. Thank you. Roll call has been requested. Roll call is granted. Senator Rood. Mr. President, um, I rise in support of this amendment. Um, it is uh, a little later than we thought, but uh, would have liked because of the lateness of the letter that was uh, given to us. And um, I think it's a, it's a good solution. Um, Senator Bach has sat down with me and we've had uh, long conversations over this. And we've also had many of the stakeholders in my office talking about this. And I think um, it, it's a problem that needs to be uh, solved and giving it more time to get the job done, I think is reasonable. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my uh, response I received from the um, MPCA is that to this amendment would cause them to start over in their rulemaking process because the EPA would respond again and thus delay and cost more money because they'd have to begin, they'd have to redo all the scientific um, stuff they've started. So I would oppose this amendment. Seeing no further discussion or roll call being requested, the Secret Senator Ingebrigtsen. I would take this as a friendly amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll on the A50 amendment.
I call Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Senator Anderson votes yes. Anderson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes yes. Benson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazalka votes yes. Gazalka votes aye. Senator Duck Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes yes. Johnson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes yes. Miller votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes yes. Rosen votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes yes. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Coran Sen votes yes. And Senator Coran votes aye. Call Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Champion, I report a no vote. Champion votes no. Senator Friends. Senator Clausen votes no. Clausen votes no. Senator Friends. Senator Lopez Franzen votes no. Lopez Franzen votes nay. Senator Friends. Senator Kent votes no. Kent votes nay. Senator Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Port votes no. Port votes nay. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 39 ayes and 26 nays, the amendment is adopted. Further amendments? Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A55 amendment. The secretary will report the A55 amendment. Senator Eaton moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows. Page four after line 22, insert. This is the A55 amendment. To the A55 amendment, Senator Eaton. Thank you. Um, this amendment uh, adds the, uh, let's see. It, it, it uses the $1 million that is in the bill for sporting events and covers the SALT applicator program at a one-time appropriation that's available for three years. The, uh, the, you know, a teaspoon of salt can permanently pollute five gallons of water, and once chloride's in a lake, um, it's nearly impossible to remove it. 50 Minnesota lakes and streams are already listed as impaired by chlorine, and another 75 water bodies nearing levels that harm aquatic life. My um, bill will, seeks to reduce the amount of salt used by those who treat driveways, sidewalks, parking lots, and by codifying the MPCA smart salt training in statute and giving the agency um, fee authority to pay for the ongoing costs associated with running the program. The bill also offers companies liability protection from slip and fall lawsuits if they receive training and certification in smart salting using best management practices. I think this is an important um, consideration for the uh, uh, protection of our water. To the A55 amendment, Senator Ingerbretson. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I rise uh, against the amendment, um, in the A55, and encourage folks to vote no. The, uh, what's, what needs to be known here is uh, the, certainly the salt, salt issue is, is coming forward uh, when it, when it we're talking about environment, and, and, and they're doing a great job of applying salt now at, at lighter, lighter loads, whereas before they would simply go along the roads and just dump, 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 or on the driveways or parking lots. And so the, the MPCA right now, you should know, is also uh, training for this right now. So uh, to take money from the uh, tourism uh, for something that's already basically uh, getting going, and I expect it's going to actually 
uh, come forward uh, next year. They're talking about uh, charging fees. Frankly, I think the MPCA should be paying for this because it's uh, certainly going to be putting less salt in the water, but it's already being done. And uh, members, again, I think this tourism uh, uh, section of the bill uh, should stay there, remain there, so, so more money, again, will be generated in the state of Minnesota, all over the state of Minnesota. And uh, those proceeds, uh, of course, from the sales tax and whatever else that the visitors uh, uh, do when they come here, it's going to really, really benefit our environment. So a lot of this has already been done. I would ask for a no vote. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to emphasize that this bill makes the uh, training and the uh, all of the work that needs to be done for the salt applicator program to not, there isn't a fee involved so that it would be covered by the um, MPCA. And I also would request roll call. Roll call has been requested. Roll call is granted. Senator Herr. Thank you, Mr. President. And then I rise to support uh, Senator Eden A55 amendment. As someone who cares about the environment, uh, water quality, and uh, prevention of pollution and enhancement of our outdoor habitat. Um, the water that we drink here today, or the water we use today, is pretty much circulate from the past. And we have to do our due diligence today so that our future generation can have at least something close to what we have now and not producing water um, by commerce. You know, salt, salt is damaging to our water, you know, not just the water that we drink, the water we swim, but also our micro organization, our, our micro um, bioorganism, you know, the plant, plankton. Uh, so the less we use salt, the better, not only for our sidewalk or, or our uh, green grass in the yard, if too much salt in it, the green grass will die pretty much, but it's mainly for our lakes. You know, I visit one of the um, demonstration done by University of Minnesota, and they show the um, microorganization or the plankton of the past. There's so much diversity in there. And today, when they show uh, the photo of one of the lake that I represent, Lake Phelan, the microorganization in the lake are so few, so few of diverse, diversity that could feed to larger uh, insect and then up to the food chain to our fish. So salt. It's a major contribution, contributor to this haphazard that killing our microorganisms and also our aquatic wildlife, including fish, frog, and so forth. So the less we use salt or apply salt, the better. Twelve years ago, before I served the Senate here, I had an opportunity to, to be certified, the same program that uh, Senator Eden is talking about through the Mississippi watershed and the Ramsey County watershed, uh, they, you know, invited me to join along with um, maintenance crew from a Hmong church. And I think that changed my view for the better and also changed the practice and the habit that we uh, tend to apply salt in everything when during winter on thick ice, or on snow and so forth. So, like Senator Eden said earlier, one teaspoon of salt impacts five gallons. And just imagine the tiny teaspoon, just the size of your thumb here, can affect or impact, contaminate five gallons of water. So, I do support, again, Senator Eden Amendment A55. And I hope for more education, less use of salt to preserve our environment, our water, and the aqua ecosystem for the future generation. And I thought this provision, I'm 
sat in the environment, environment policy committee and I thought this provision already made it through the layover and perhaps uh, going to make it through here on the floor, but it disappeared and I thought it had bipartisan support with majority of member on the other eyes on it, you know, but I cannot believe that even with bipartisan, with member on the other eyes leading it, it disappeared when I get to the floor. So again, this is an opportunity where we put the language back into this environment omnibus bill. So thank you, and I ask members to support Senator Eden's A55. Senator Root. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Eaton yield? She will, Senator Rood. Uh, Senator Eaton, uh, thank you for bringing this forward, but I do have a question on your funding. Are you using the mil uh, part of the million dollars that would go to the Explore Minnesota Tourism from uh, to the sports industry? Senator Eaton. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the question, Senator Rood. Yes, I am using the funding that was proposed by um, Senator Rosen to use for uh, promoting sporting events. Senator Rood. Mr. President, well, members, this is actually my bill, Senate Files 2768. It's a, it's a bill that's very near and dear to my heart. I've worked on this for four years. It's a bill that it should have made it over the finish line many times over. It's passed uh, committee after committee. It's had great hearings, great support from all over the state of Minnesota. But I also uh, rise in opposition only because of the funding mechanism. I believe uh, using the lottery in lieu money, whether it's for sporting or for whether it's a, a project that I believe in totally is wrong. I believe that using the million dollars out of the environmental trust fund money for sporting goods or for sporting events is wrong. And so I could not in good faith say that using that money for something else, even though it's good for the environment, is okay. And so um, even though I would like the salt applicator bill to be done, it should be done, I cannot agree to the funding because I don't agree with the funding in this bill to begin with. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebretson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and, and thank you, Senator Rood, for, for clarifying that the bill is already moving forward. Uh, it has as well in the House. Um, so, uh, Senator Hur, you talked about, you know, fish for your kids, and, and, you know, the fish that I brought you that time was caught in fresh water, and there was no salt in that water. So I just wanted to remind you of that. But, no, uh, uh, we just had a... Uh, it was funded to drop some... Uh, some crappies off with Senator Herr because I know he loves to, uh, to eat fish and uh, he keeps selling, saying we're going to go fishing someday, but we have a, we're, we're going to have time now to do that, so at least I will. Uh, Senator Herr, uh, but members, again, this is, uh, this is taking uh, uh, a large chunk out of the uh, general fund money that's, that's uh, a little bit is in the uh, bill here, and uh, I think the, uh, the, the sporting events that are going to be uh, um, I mean, they're going to be all over the state of Minnesota, not only the rural areas, but the metro. And to take that money out of here for something that's already moving forward, I think uh, uh, it's, very, it's not a very good thought. I, I, uh, um, so again, I, I, I don't support the bill. To that point, Senator Rood? Yes, Mr. President, uh, I would like to make a, collect, a correction. Um, this bill is not moving forward. It's passed all the committees, but it's not been included. So. Um, it is not moving forward. It needs to move forward, but it is not at this time. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. My cord is tangled up. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate Senator Eaton's amendment and strongly support it, and I think that Senator Herr's comments are really on the mark. The fact that we're really grossly oversalting for safety reasons and so on, just because it's easier that than take any risk. This program was well designed, and I want to really thank Senator Root for the work over the years on this, because it's a common sense thing, and I, I have not yet figured out why people are unwilling to get it over the finish line. Um, and then I also 
agree with Senator Rood strongly that the lottery and lieu money should not be used the way it's being used in this bill. But I would urge you, Senator Rood, to rethink the thing here because you cannot get rid of it. I mean, in this bill, it's being used for some sports events promotion. And I see no reason why we're putting the teeny tiny bit of general fund money in the bill. The only general fund money in the bill, I believe, is going to that tourism promotion for sports, not for environment, outdoor stuff, but for big national sporting events. And that's a thing people might want to put taxpayer money into. I'm not a big fan of spending taxpayer money to promote events coming here in that way. We've subsidized sports in so many ways. But Senator Rood, I guess I think that when you have a choice, this amendment is not, you can vote against the bill, which takes that million bucks and uses it that way. But here you've got a choice between if it's going to be used for something that's totally inappropriate and something that really would help the environment, something you care deeply about. I'm just making a personal appeal to you because I think I agree with all the work you've done on this bill. I think it really needs to happen. And because all the salt is accumulated, if we clean this problem up, if we stop oversalting in five years from now, we finally get around to it. It's too late. All this stuff is already added in there, and it is once the lakes are salty, we're not going to get the, the salt out of them. So the more we can do, the quicker we can do it, the better. And I'd say that, Senator Rood, I strongly appreciate the work you've done on the bill, and I would just urge you to rethink. I, again, I strongly agree with you. This is inappropriate use of the lottery and loo money, the way the bill is using it. But switching it from a totally inappropriate use to a way that's less bad since that's the only choice we have on this amendment. I urge you to support the amendment. I think it's a good one, and I think we urgently need to address the oversalting. This is a responsible thing. Maybe MnDOT trucks are doing a better job. This is making it available for any private business that's in the area. They want to make sure they oversalt because they're worried about liability. This bill gives them protection from that. Urge your support. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Members, uh, Senator Root has done uh, fantastic work on this bill, and she's to be commended, and I thank her for uh, shepherding this bill as far as it has gotten. Uh, when Senator Root brought it to committee, um, and it got uh, very favorable treatment uh, from committee and moved on to its next stop, I thought, finally, after, I don't know, five or six years, um, this bill, which seems like a no-brainer, and every year that it's come forward has seemed like the feel-good bipartisan bill of the year, is finally going to get through this time. Uh, and now to, to find out it's been kind of stopped dead in its tracks. Um, it's not in this omnibus bill, and it's languishing in some other uh, committee. Um, members, the experts, advocates, uh, and you know, even men many members of, of the commercial applicators sector agree that this is a good idea and this idea should be spread wider, no pun intended, uh, that, uh, that uh, sorry, I honestly, didn't mean to say that. <laughs> that you know, this, is a, this is a package of good ideas. You know, the trial lawyers are happy because of the liability issues, and, and we know that we can use a whole lot less salt. We just need to teach people how to do that. And uh, folks have been working really, really hard on it, and it has bipartisan support in both chambers, yet here we are um, trying to revive this idea on the floor. We know how damaging salt is, as that's already been articulated. Uh, we have a funding source that is an environmental purpose. Thank you, Senator Marty. Um, let's just do this. It's easy to do. Everyone's for it. It's been worked on for five years. Senator Engelbertson said, salt's a day is coming. Well, you know, five years, six years, how long, how long should such a simple, easy, good idea take to pass into policy in the Minnesota legislature? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Root. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Marty and Senator Dibble. You know, I've spent most of my career here protecting the dedicated funds, what the people voted for, what's in the Constitution. And there is no less bad place to spend it. If it's bad, it's bad, and it shouldn't be done. And so as much as I'd like this to go forward, just saying that, oh, it's, okay, it's not okay to spend it there, but now, well, I want this done, so now I should spend it here, that's how we get into trouble. 
And that's, we just, we have to be, we have to stand tall and say, if it's wrong for that, it's wrong for this. And just because I want it, just because I would really like this to be done, um, doesn't make it okay. Senator Eaton. Thank you. To that point, um, Mr. President, I have to agree with uh, Senator Rood. This is not an appropriate use of lottery and loo money, and I will withdraw my amendment. The A55 amendment is withdrawn. Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have the A51 amendment. Secretary will report the A51 amendment. Senator Goggin moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 81, after line 23, insert. This is the A51 amendment. To the A51 amendment, Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I have worked with uh, Senator Inger Britson on this uh, amendment, and um, it's similar to the, kind of the timeline that uh, Senator Bach had with, with his amendment. Um, I got to commend our folks in Wabasha County and uh, the West Newton Special Use District. They were working together to ensure that uh, the improvements that the West Newton Special Use District was looking to do uh, in their area on their on their building structures uh, would meet the uh, Wabasha County floodplain management uh, plan. Uh, and in so doing, they realized that the state law does not allow variances within the ordinances for. Uh, what they were looking to do. So what this amendment does is it just allows um, the uh, Wabasha County to work with West Newton uh, Special Use District uh, to do the variances needed to ensure that uh, the improvements in the existing structures in their uh, district uh, are in accordance with the Wabasha County floodplain that's in effect uh, as of January 1 of 2022. And with that, Mr. Chair, uh, President, I stand for any questions. To the A51 amendment. Senator Ingerbretson. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I support the the amendment. Um, there's no fiscal uh, 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 portion of this. I mean, there's nothing coming out of the budget. It is just simply a, uh, talking with uh, Senator Goggin uh, over the last while. Uh, this is something that's needed to move to be able to move forward in uh, basically a. Uh, uh, a tweak that uh, works for uh, part of his district, so I, I would support this. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Mr. President, again, we're doing committee work on the floor of the Senate here. We have what look like some uh, fairly arcane and, you know, I don't, well, who knows if they're arcane or complicated or not. We don't have the benefit of uh, hearing from stakeholders the relevant state agencies or local authorities to really uh, understand what's happening here. Um, Mr. President, would Senator Goggin please yield? He will, Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, Senator Goggin, um, can you tell us and tell the public who's listening um, on this particular matter um, if any state agencies, uh, Bowser, DNR, PCA, um, you know, who, who administers these rules, Minnesota Rules Part 6120.5800 Subpart 3, because we are we're doing a notwithstanding, so we're saying we don't have to follow that rule uh, so that some local unit of government can do something. Um, can you tell us if you've had any conversations with any state agencies who administer that section of rules? Senator Goggin. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I did uh, forget to mention that uh, we did work in conjunction with the Department of Natural Resources on this uh, to ensure that what we did would uh, uh, be in agreement with what, uh, what, they, what they can do and what they have jurisdiction over. Uh, and what prompted this uh, whole um, uh, amendment was uh, this is uh, water that, or land that's close to the water that the DNR has jurisdiction over. Uh, so we did ensure that we had the proper government agencies engaged. And uh, at the at the time that we went through, as we went through this, we ensured that uh, we actually had a, a, a person from the DNR uh, supporting us in drafting this language. Senator Dibble. Um, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator, Senator Goggin would yield. He will continue to yield. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Senator Goggin, do you, I mean, do you have any indication to us from the DNR in writing, or you know, can the DNR send a signal into us into this chamber? Um, you know, once again, you know, you know, I, I just have to say, you know, parenthetically that um, I will probably have some amendments that, on future bills. I might have some amendments today uh, on this bill that uh, maybe uh, weren't heard in committee that are pretty smart. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be lectured to by uh, the wise elders of this chamber that uh, we don't do committee work on the Senate floor. So, uh, Senator Goggin, um, is, there, is there any way for us to, uh, to see in writing or have some reassurance that, uh, that we're not doing something pretty bad? I mean, we're, we are overcoming, we are superseding, we are notwithstanding uh, uh, rules. Uh, and we know that you know, this has to do with floodplain management, has to do with flooding, has to do with water quality, et cetera. And I don't want to inadvertently vote for something that's going to have a fairly negative consequence uh, in terms of water quality or even for, you know, for flood management. Uh, you know, even though I don't represent that area of the state, I care about my responsibility to the citizens. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, I do not have anything in writing. We did uh, ask for that from the DNR. They said they would neither oppose nor uh, take a stand on this. They were going to stay neutral on it, um, but they, you know, they were not going to contest it. Uh, and unfortunately, yes, this is something they were. The, these folks in my district had been working on, and, and it did come up late that they realized that the state. Uh, was it, the state statute was in the way of allowing the, the county to do the variance, uh, which our cities already have that ability to do that variance. Um, so this is just putting us in, in uh, line with that. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, we did work with the DNR, and, uh, and they're, they're not going to uh, take a position either way on this at this time. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A51 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? No. The motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. Senator Herr. Amendment? Okay. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I have. Uh, a35 amendment at the desk. The secretary will report the A35 amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 13 before line three insert. This is the A35 amendment. To the A35 amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President, members. Last year, in dealing with the chronic wasting disease, we tried, I think we're, the state is moving far too slowly on this issue. Last year, we tried to get a moratorium on new deer farms, and nothing happened. We came close on the Senate floor. Um, but I think it's moved beyond the situation where we just keep waiting and waiting and taking the little steps we're doing. We're, we're three steps behind all the time. And as we have spreading problems with chronic wasting disease, uh, I think the state's deer herd is a great threat. The health of our environment is a threat. And so this is a simple legislation that would simply uh, stop farming of white-tailed deer in Minnesota after a year and a half from now. Um, it would continue that they cannot move live deer, they could not import deer, and would have to phase out their herds by August of 2024. Um, the problem with CWD has been largely caused by the movement of deer for deer farming. And I think it's something that we're all going to pay for in the long run. Um, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association has called for an end to deer farming in Minnesota. I think it's time that we do this. I urge your support for this. It's, it's something that once, it, as it continues to spread, it's going to cause great harm. There is some evidence that the disease can spread. It spreads to other mammals, and we worry about public health concerns in that in the long run. But at this time, as DNR and Board of Animal Health 
continue to ramp up and will continue and continue to ramp up efforts seems to me one of the biggest causes of it is something we ought to just say, we've done enough of this. It was an experiment. Let's call an end to it. I urge your support and ask for roll call. Roll call has been requested and a roll call granted. Discussion to the A35 amendment. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. President, would uh, Senator Marty yield? Senator Marty will yield. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Marty, do you know uh, if this uh, has a, a companion in the Senate? Uh, I know it, it's been and worked on in the other body. Um, as far as our, our committee, uh, I don't know that we've had a lot of discussion about it this year. Now, of course, it's been certainly on the, uh, you know, on the, on the burner here for the last couple of years, but I'm just wondering, uh, this is a pretty significant change here, and I know the, uh, the uh, Department of Ag has been, has been uh, very involved in this, uh, uh, as well as the administration. And, and I know they were going to do some shared management and, 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 uh, between the DNR and the Board of Animal Health. And um, I'm just wondering if, if, uh, if you've been working with those members over there or working with the Board of Animal Health and, and moving this, uh, uh, this initiative forward. Senator Marty. Mr. President, um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I believe this is, has been introduced in the House. It has been introduced in the Senate as well. Been no hearings here. I think it is an appropriate issue to deal with. I have been in discussions with several House members about this, and I think it's something that it's time. I would have much preferred that this be heard in committee, but would urge that you're, you accept it here. And um, the difficulty is when that, that herd near Bemidji was infected and the guy illegally dumped the carcasses and so on. We know that that's what's causing a lot of the spread. The movement of herds has been a huge problem. And simply, we're two, three, four, maybe 10 steps behind. And once the cat's out of the bag, it's kind of hard to get it back in. So let's try and stop more of the deer from getting out of the, out of the situation and spreading the disease. I think it's time to stop it now. There are half a million deer hunters in Minnesota there's a whole lot of people in the state that care about this population, the wild herd, and why a couple hundred operations are able to cause so much damage. Um, it's time to stop it now. I think this was an experiment that didn't pay off in a good way for the state. I think it's time to end it, so I urge your support. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, uh, Senator Marty, I, I, I don't totally disagree with you, but there has been a lot of movement. You say it's been dragging on and on and on um, since I've been involved in this. Um, I think there were well over 700 farms in the state of Minnesota, and I think right now we're down to, and, I, and, and you shouldn't quote me on this because Senator Westrom's been working real hard on this, being it's a uh, more of a farm issue. Uh, I know it's confusing for people when when uh, we talk about uh, farming for, uh, for the whitetail, uh, and then of course the DNR has oversight over the whitetail management, wild white time, uh, whitetail management, but not the farm management. So we've tried to get them people to work together uh, and come up with something other than just totally uh, uh, shutting down the uh, uh, whitetail farm, and under this, under this particular amendment, uh, you're requiring it to actually uh, shut down by August 1st, 2024. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, if I might, Mr. President, uh, Senator Westrom is here now. He's done uh, an extensive amount of work on the uh, deer farming situation, and uh, um, maybe Senator Marty would be so kind as to uh, explain again real quickly what the amendment is, and, and uh, uh, he can respond to that. Senator Marty will yield. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, Senator Ingebrigtsen, the bill would simply do three things, one of which would be to uh, prohibit importation of, of um, live white-tailed deer. 
Second one, it would be that you cannot move them from farms except for slaughter. And the third one would be that you have to phase out all white-tailed deer in the farms after August of 2024. Senator Westrow. Mr. President, uh, Senator Marty, I would rise in opposition uh, to your amendment and urge members to uh, not eradicate deer farmers in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Senator Marty, I don't know why we would try to eliminate this niche uh, specialty farming that uh, many farmers have either incorporated into their farm or taken uh, old dairy barns that uh, aren't being used very much and found a new way to raise livestock, uh, Senator Marty. Uh, the, the idea of harming these farmers uh, when you've got a state like Wisconsin to the west, uh, east of us uh, with about a third or more of its wild deer population uh, already with CWD and blame it on the deer farmers in Minnesota, uh, it just doesn't make sense, Senator Marty. Uh, this is an important disease or virus that we need to continue to research and find ways to test live uh, CWD tests without having to depopulate. And so we put a lot of money into that through the environment bill. Uh, but don't take it out on our deer farmers that live all across our state, uh, from northwest Minnesota, central Minnesota, southern Minnesota. And Senator Marty, uh, you have a lot of uh, specialty farmers, even in your area, uh, some called urban ag. Uh, many of them have found ways to uh, find niche agriculture opportunities. And our deer farmers have done the same. They've been just as innovative as your farmers in your area. Uh, but they're not causing the CWD outbreak. We have provisions in law where uh, when a CWD might be found, and mind you, many times it's in the wild when they find it, uh, Senator Marty. Uh, we do impose endemic, endemic zones, endemic zones for 15-mile radiuses around those until they kind of get things under control, but to shut down the whole state and tell every deer farmer, small deer farmer, small family farms, these are family farms, Senator Marty. And members, so that's why I would raise or, and urge you to oppose this. Uh, let's embrace specialty farming and niche agriculture in our state. Not everybody can be a corn and bean soybean farmer. We have many great farmers that are corn and soybean farmers. Others find specialty crops or niches. And this is one of the niches our state has going across many counties. And so uh, let's embrace agriculture opportunities in our state. Let's make it easier for our farmers to uh, diversify and find niches and prosper rather than have government uh, harm them and shut them down. And these family farms, if you would have been in our Ag Committee's members uh, this February and March, it was tear-jerking to hear what the 90-day no-movement order that the DNR popped upon the deer farms by surprise they wouldn't even tell their co-equal or concurrent authority Board of Animal Health because they thought they were going to pop this on everybody. And it was devastating financially to these family farms. There were buckets of tears in our Agriculture Committee members with family farmers that were on the edge of losing their livelihood. And Senator Marty, I cannot believe you would try to do that to our family farmers, but that would be the net effect of this amendment, and so I would urge a no vote.
Friendly reminder to direct all debate through the President. Uh, next on my list, Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I was just wondering if uh, Senator Marty would yield. Senator Marty will yield. Senator Lang. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, Senator Marty, I, I guess um, I'm a little hesitant looking at the, uh, you know, this is something I've been involved with pretty heavily, re realistically, over the last five years, and uh, not impugning motives by any means or questioning your expertise in the field of, of deer farming, but um, <laughs> how many deer farms are there in Minnesota, Senator Marty? Senator Marty. Mr. President, I believe there are about 200 and, uh, somewhere between 200 and 250, I believe. Senator Lang. And if you continue to yield, Mr. Chair. Senator or, Marty Mr. will President. continue to yield. Senator Lang. How many, how many positive cases of CWD have been reported in uh, Minnesota's deer farmers? Senator Marty. Mr. President, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, how Senator many positive Lang. cases of CWD have been reported? Uh, via the deer farms in Minnesota. Senator Marty. Mr. President, I haven't been keeping count, and I'm sorry I cannot tell you that. Senator Lang. Well, you know, once, somebody once told me that if you don't know the answer to a question, don't ask it, but the, the answer is one, one case in the state of Minnesota. Um, I, I, I'm going to continue to ask him questions if you continue to yield, just to tr try and prove a couple of points, and then I'll make my last statement. Senator Marty will continue to yield. Senator Lang. Uh, Senator Marty, um, how much do you know exactly how much a adult male white-tailed deer is worth to a farmer? Senator Marty, um, Mr. President, no, I do not know, and I I know it depends on the size. Um, trophy hunters like it always struck me as strange to be hunting penned animals, but um, I cannot tell you the price. I did get a number that there are 175 deer farms right now. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. President. So the, the, the answer to that is tens of thousands of dollars per animal. And the way deer farms work is they, they grow these animals, they have private hunts on their property, they have deer that are shipped from one state to another that are worth tens of thousands of dollars to these farmers, one animal. Um, this, this amendment that Senator Marty is offering is not just a moratorium to new farms. It is, a, it is killing an industry. And if I could ask one more question, and this is really the big one, because deer farmers have been largely open to the idea of a buyout. And I'm not going to exclude that factor and say that they haven't been thinking about it because there's so much pressure upon them that their businesses are not succeeding right now. The DNR has a movement moratorium on, so they can't profit from these animals that they've been producing since they were young. Also, I think this is an opportunity. This is something I want the Senate to listen to just a little bit. This is something where the DNR and these deer farmers have an opportunity to get together and do something that is pretty exciting, actually, when it comes to CWD. These deer farms can genetically eliminate CWD. They do it by genetically farming deers and, and having the right code, and believe it, it's beyond me, members. They can get together and they can do this. They could genetically eliminate CWD if they are allowed to do so, if they work in conjunction with the DNR. That's pretty exciting news. I think we should all be a part of that. Stop blaming the deer farmers, please. That's all I have, Mr. President. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a brief comment, because um, Senator Western was saying, are we going to eliminate these 175 farmers and calling for elimination of this industry? I, I guess I think in terms of uh, 175 deer farmers, a half million deer, far half million deer hunters in Minnesota, a statewide herd that had been healthy in the past that's being affected by this, um, maybe there are only a few bad actors, but simply moving herds of wild deer, keeping them close together, I mean, the, the close congregation of the animals is the way that spreads. And I think that this is an issue we really need to address. And yes, it's going to be harder for 175 farmers, but for the whole rest of the population, everybody who goes deer hunting, everybody else who wants a healthy herd of animals in the state, 
I think it's time to do this, and um, that's why Deer Hunter Association has been calling for an end to farming of cervidae here, at least for deer farming. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is an issue, quite honestly, that this body has failed to address uh, since it came up. Um, there's been fight every step of the way. You want to know why we need to deal with this? Because it's killing off deer. There are over 500,000 deer hunters in this state. Hunting in Minnesota is over a billion dollar industry, especially in northern Minnesota. The Minnesota Deer Hunters Association proudly and loudly supports phasing out and buy out of these deer farms, of issuing a moratorium on new captive farms. Why? Because it is not recommended to eat deer that are CWD positive. And if all the deer get infected, or majority, it not only impacts Minnesota's economy, but quite possibly the health of Minnesotans. So that is why we need to regulate this industry. And that is why we need to buy out, phase out, and prohibit additional farms that will spread CWD. And people are worried about, I don't know, I have numbers like around 200, Mark, for, for these farms. If it's less than that, so be it. 500,000 deer hunters and the largest hunting organization supports this. Vote yes. Any further discussion to the A35 amendment? Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the A35 amendment. I call on Senator Duckworth to report the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Pratt votes no. Pratt votes no. Call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Frentz. I report Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Frentz. I report Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Frentz. I report, I report Senator Lopez Franzen votes aye. Lopez Franzen votes aye. Senator Frentz. I report Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Frentz. And I report Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. All members having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 27 ayes and 39 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, will, I, will, I will pass um, a, a piece of paper with the map of Minnesota of our state part. Our state part is uh, one of the most valuable assets in, here in Minnesota. Uh, it has beautiful wildlife, trees, and it withstands all weathers. 
Our 75 state park across Minnesota are open to all year round for hiking, camping, picnicking, fishing, sightseeing, and so forth. Literally, feel us, almost. They were popular safe haven for families and people during the pandemic. And it helped save a lot of lives um, during the time of needs. Uh, furthermore, our state part also present a more equitable access to everyone than a high sell ticket sport events. So Mr. President, my amendment 836 at 1.4 million appropriation to the Board of Tourism to promote our state part and natural resource. Um, the secretary will report the A36 amendment. Senator Herr moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page eight, delay lines three to six. Etc. This is the A36 amendment. To the A36 amendment, Senator Herr. And thank you, Mr. President. And I will ask roll call for this amendment, and I ask member to support this uh, amendment. It uh, it delete the boards of tourism appropriation in the bill, and also delete the use of the one percent lottery in lieu for the new event promotion account and. It adds the uh, uh, dollars, as I mentioned earlier, to promote um, state part and natural resource uh, targeting people from outside our state of Minnesota as well. Thank you. Roll call has been requested and a roll call granted. Discussion to the amendment. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and uh, Senator Herr for bringing this forward. I, uh, I have to... Uh, uh, ask for a no vote on the A36. What this does is takes away the, the uh, promoting uh, in the bill of the large events, and I'm not understanding why people are against that. Um, it's going to bring a lot of, lot of tourism back to the, or into the state of Minnesota, and uh, along with tourism and a lot of people comes money, and all that money gets spent, portions of it is going to end up in the environment. Um, so this is actually going towards, I understand, state parks. We have beautiful state parks. I think there's some uh, appropriations in the uh, bonding bill to, uh, to actually uh, uh, do some repair uh, as, as we should, I guess. Over the, over the years, we have done that, and we continue to do that. Uh, but I think uh, Minnesota State Parks does a tremendous job of, of, of uh, selling themselves to uh, well, for certain Minnesotans, but uh, adjoining states as well. So I would uh, seriously, I, I, would, I, would, I would have the author reconsider this, or I would uh, actually have to ask him for a, uh, you guys for a red vote. Discussion to the A36 amendment. Any further discussion to the amendment? Senator Herr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, as you see here on, on the paper I just passed over, has all the, uh, all the location of our state parks, and most of them are um, in the uh, uh, rural, the suburb area of our state, and uh, this will uh, bring tourism to our rural area as well and benefit the local economy there as well. So. This is not just a, a, uh, a freebie ask. It's when people travel to a destination, they pump gas, they buy food, they um, purchase certain things, so our economy generates through our state park that are public to everyone. So uh, again, I want to resonate as support of this uh, uh, amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the A36 amendment. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't have any more questions, but I have to respond to these uh, comments, uh, Senator Herr's comments that uh, this is going to bring people to the state parks. I don't know if anybody in this room has had to reserve any, any, uh, any spaces in the uh, state parks in our state, but right now, at least the last four times that I did, you had to do it months ahead of time because our state parks are being utilized. They are being filled up. I would think that we would like to have them filled up with people that are coming here for large events. Large events will, again, uh, be a great economic driver for the state of Minnesota, not only in the metro, but rural. So uh, folks, our state parks are doing well. 
and uh, we just need to move beyond this idea that that uh, it's bad to have business come to our state of Minnesota. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a good thing. So, again, vote no on this amendment. Any further discussion to the amendments? Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to remind people that this is the lottery in lieu money. This money went through a constitutional amendment that the people of Minnesota agreed that um, the excess funds would be spent on the environment. Both uh, Senator Rood and I agree that it should not be spent outside of that, and um, that is why I withdrew my um, uh, SALT amendment. And so I would encourage a um, vote in favor of this amendment, and I thank you. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't want to belabor this, but uh, I, I said this earlier, this particular lottery and lieu money that everybody's having a problem with actually brings one more percent uh, into the corpus. And general fund, it takes one percent out of the general fund from 28 to 27 percent. That's all it does. 1%, but it also adds 1% to the lottery. So members, uh, we're really arguing over something that's really, really, really foolish. Uh, we should all be in favor of this. Any further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on the A36 amendment. Call on Senator Duckworth to report the votes of members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes no. Call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Lopez Franzen votes aye. Lopez Franzen votes aye. Senator Frentz. And Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. All members having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 30 ayes and 36 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen mentioned earlier that he had brought uh, a number of provisions forward in this bill, which he's brought forward a number of times in years past. Um, and uh, in those years past, I have brought forward my objections uh, to those provisions, and uh, that's why I stand today, Mr. President, members. Um, I think Mr. Senator Ingerson said he, he wouldn't necessarily bore us with all the details, and I think I will bore you with some of the details <laughs> about, about the things that are in here that I object to, um, and I think don't serve the best interest of the public and Minnesota's environment. Members, uh, Mr. President, Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, although we all know it's more like 15,000 or more. 
We have amazing streams, rivers, and wetlands, and we have bountiful groundwater, too. And Minnesotans prize our waters for drinking, for our economy, for our health, for our wildlife, for our recreation and enjoyment. When we think about the photos that are used to promote our state, to let other people who are not from here know what our state is like, those are photos of lakes and rivers, of people swimming, fishing, uh, photos of the hundreds of interconnected pristine lakes of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area that Senator Bach, by and large, represents. And when we passed the Legacy Amendment in 2008, think about that, members. Minnesotans opted to increase their own taxes in our state's constitution, and it was a measure that passed by a wider margin than anyone or anything had passed on a statewide basis in any election in our state's history. It was shown that the reason they voted in those large numbers was because of the promise that those legacy funds had for restoring and preserving our state's waters. So members, I think the public will be shocked to see this bill because this bill puts our waters on the public auction block. This bill says, no, our waters are not here for everyone's benefit. They are not to be protected, kept clean, restored, entrusted so that our health, our wildlife, and our drinking water be kept safe. If you just take a look at the bill, straight up, there's a provision would allow industry to dump more pollution from its operations into the adjacent rivers. More pollution, killing more fish, increasing toxicity, a three-time, three-fold increase by the PCA's analysis in pollution. Another provision says that anyone who lives more than one county away from a proposal, whether they're downstream or downwind, that would affect and would poison the air they breathe or the water they drink or the water they swim in or the water they fish in, they have nothing to say. They have no standing. They can't say a word. They can't object. They can't sign a petition asking that there be a closer look, an analysis, an examination of that proposal to pollute. Another idea in this bill, if your factory is polluting the water around it, fouling our drinking water, and there is a change made in that factory, say, 10 years ago. That pollution cannot be required to be mitigated and removed because they've made some sort of a improvement to their facility sometime within the last 16 years. There are numerous provisions that say if too much groundwater is being taken out or the groundwater usage is threatening someone's private well that they need for their household, or the groundwater is threatening a scarce supply. Nope, no worries. Numerous provisions in this bill say just carry on as you were, and that effort to draw the groundwater is even made more easy. Also, that amazingly is contained in this bill are numerous provisions that would construe efforts to help companies and people to protect the environment as a rule or law, just information, advice, help, assistance. That would be deemed in this bill as a new rule or a new law and be disallowed. It's a gag order on our ability to help folks who want to do well, who want to go through the permitting process, et cetera. Paradoxically, would work against what are the stated aims of this bill to speed up permitting processes. These would slow those down. So, Mr. President, I would offer the A27 amendment. The Secretary will report the A27 amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page three, deletes Delete lines four to six. This is the A27 amendment. To the A27 amendment, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to request a roll call vote on the A27 amendment. Roll call is requested. Roll call granted. Senator Dibble. So, Mr. President, members, um, what this bill would do is basically, um, for the most part, um, eliminate and, uh, and strike the provisions that are contained throughout uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen's bill. I didn't count up, but I think there's 
There's probably 15 or 20 sections in this bill, I should have counted them up, that would simply be deleted uh, because they do nothing to improve our environment, they harm our environment. If this bill were to pass into law, our water and our air would be more polluted. These provisions need to come out. This is not an environment bill, this is an anti-environment bill. Um, additionally, it has, uh, it removes funding uh, for the provision that I spoke of, creating some rules that would allow for three times the amount of pollution to be emitted, be emitted from a particular industry into the adjacent uh, waters. It provides uh, some, uh, some laws and rules for how the PCA could actually enforce and, in, and, and improve its ability to regulate uh, for pollution. And then it has a provision that would um, provide for the state to plan for uh, long-term sustainability of the waters of our state. Thank you, Mr. President. To the A27 amendment, Senator Ingerbritson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and Senator Dibble. Um, members, uh, I rise in opposition to the A27, and here's the reason why. Um, members, Senator Dibble and I uh, have been going back and forth over the last years on, on how terrible the bills that we bring forward and don't care about our waters and streams and lakes and, and um, reminds everybody about hunting and or swimming and fishing and and uh, you know I it's it's almost to the point of uh, um, basically I, I guess theater is what it is I, I I've said it before on the floor. Uh, whether you know it or not, my district represents one-tenth of the lakes in the state of Minnesota. Just my district. And if anyone in this room would come down here and think that I would allow industry to dump sewage into the water uh, or stand in the way or stand in front or allow such, such activity such as that. What this bill does is, and on your desk members, you, you have the Chamber of Commerce uh, that's going to be grading this, and to some of you it means nothing, but to others it does, uh, because they, they actually are about business growing in Minnesota. Uh, it, uh, it, it takes out the uh, affluent toxic toxicity portion of the bill, uh, public water inventory, I think Senator Lang's bill. It, it takes out the, uh, uh, it actually it adds more ability for the DNR to come up with heavier fines. Do we want that, members? Do you want them to uh, come out with their uh, the thumb pressing on, on folks, uh, on, on businesses? I don't think so. I don't think you want that. I think the calls and the emails that you get will, will absolutely blow up your phone. So members, uh, I, guess I respectfully uh, ask you for a, a red vote on the A27 amendment. Further discussion to the A27 amendment? Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I rise in support of this bill. Um, and as Senator Dibble was speaking about um, the potential hazards and, and harm done to the land, the air, and the water in, um, that the, bill, the, the full bill might uh, um, provide opportunity for, it made me think about uh, where I grew up and what happened in the community that I grew up in. I grew up where the Mississippi River and the Watab Creek meet. And um, at that juncture, there was a paper mill. And that paper mill would dump all their pulp and all their, um, their uh, refuse into the water. And right there, there was a dam. And when they'd open that dam, that water would churn and churn and churn all that, that pulp and, and um, garbage. And there would be foam that would probably be three stories high, yellow foam. And we'd run down to the river and look at the foam. And <clears throat> it would go, go right down the river. Who knows where it would end up? 
It also is a very agricultural community. And so at that time, there was a lot of runoff coming um, from the, the pesticides that the farmers were using. A lot of their animals would walk into the creek and, and, and do whatever. And um, at the end of my block, I mean, you might think I lived in the worst place in the world, but it was heaven, um, was a foundry that spewed all kinds of noxious um, uh, steam and air and smoke into, into the air. And I remember we grew up running in those creeks, playing in the river. Um, it was kind of an idyllic childhood, running around the farms and the animals and that sort of thing. But there came a time where my dad said, we can't be in the waters anymore. We can't play in the creek. We can't swim in the river below the dam. Um, stay away you know, out of the fields because of the pesticides. And um, while my dad was um, actually a very staunch Republican, he was in a big fan of the MPCA. And I can't forget how many times he said, thank heavens for the MPCA and their oversight. Because of that, because of the rules that they put in place in the 70s, um, the, the uh, paper mill was not able to throw their, their refuse into the waters. Um, there were more controls around pesticide. The smoke that came out of the foundry had to be controlled. And I would hate for that to come and happen again. I would hate for that not to, uh, for us not to have the authority to regulate uh, businesses and uh, f um, organizations that might see that a weakening in the controls would allow them to do things that would harm our environment. And so, with that, um, you know, it just it just sort of breaks my heart as I was thinking about that. And I, I don't think we want to be lessening any of our our, our rules and um, restrictions at this time. And so, I would encourage us all to to vote for the Dibble <coughs> Amendment and um, make sure that we are addressing the needs as they need to be and not um, making it weaker. Thank you. The secretary will take the roll on the A27 amendment. I call on Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes nay. Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And I report Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. All members having voted with the desired vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 20, 
nine ayes and 36 nays. The amendment is not adopted. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, one of the themes that I, I noticed in this environmental omnibus bill, unfortunately, is that it really does seem to say to Minnesotans, we here in the Senate, we think we know better. We think we know best. We think we know better than scientists. We think we know better than professionals. And we're going to try to carve out something that is not quite as hard as on business, um, things that will make it a little bit easier for industry. And in the meanwhile, the bill not only doesn't do the job that we need it to do to rise to meet this moment that we are in in regard to our environment here in Minnesota, but it actually sets us backwards. So there are some provisions, especially in the bill, that I'd like to, to address. Um, Several of the provisions in the bill impede the authority of the DNR and the MPCA to actually protect our air and the sustainability of our clean water. One of the changes in the bill would add unnecessary bureaucratic layers to the state's permitting process and give polluters a free pass from having to make upgrades to outdated wastewater treatment systems. Under the guise of permitting efficiency, it would prevent the DNR and the MPCA from providing documents that would actually help regulated parties understand and comply with the statutes that they, and the rules that they need to comply with. It also limited, limits citizens' participation and their ability to petition for environmental review of a permit unless they actually live in or next to a county where the project that they want to speak about is located. Now we all know that air and water pollution does not respect county boundaries, right? We all have an interest in our clean air and our clean water. It's a statewide issue, it's not just a regional issue. And furthermore, not everyone is wealthy enough to own land in an area that they enjoy visiting. Not all of us have land that we keep for hunting or for enjoyment. And their voices are important too, not just landowners and wealthier individuals. Last, the bill would lower the state standard for discharging toxic pollutants into our waterways. There's a claim that we need uniformity to meet federal standards that exist, but that exists for one specific region in the state. And the change that we're looking at in this bill would put our waters and our ecosystems at risk from increased pollutant contamination. So there's a lot of problems a lot of problems with this environmental bill. As I said, it doesn't address some of the key environmental problems that we are facing in our state today. We heard uh, our colleague, Senator Kunish, tell us a really compelling story, and she's not alone. So many of our waters in this state are impaired, meaning you cannot drink the water, you cannot fish from it, you cannot swim in it. That is a disgrace, a disgrace for the state of water. Our water should be our pride, our joy, and we need to protect them. We should entrust our agencies and empower our agencies to do their jobs to protect the people of Minnesota. Minnesotans expect no less. So it is my contention that this bill actually brings us backwards. And I would like to offer an amendment here that will take out some of the worst pieces uh, of this bill. Um, I would like to um, offer, Mr. President, the A32 amendment. The Secretary will report the A32 amendment. Senator McEwen moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page three, delete lines four to six. This is the A32 amendment. To the A32 amendment, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. So the A32 amendment 
um, would take out some of the worst provisions. Um, the PCA clean water policy modifications, the unadopted rules prohibitions, some that we've already heard about discussed today, um, the whole affluent toxicity rules changes, these so-called chemical plastic recycling provisions that create more problems than they would help. Re it would also delete um, the repaired drain holes and precast concrete tanks, allowing those to just go forward as if they were um, they were whole and to be given a presumption that they that they were fine. Um, it would also delete the permitting timeline changes for um, certain types of mining in Minnesota. So we heard we heard this provision in committee. And I have to warn people and, and advocates to be careful what you wish for here. There are many reasons why our agencies may need to take some more time with permitting. There are also reasons that permittees, so the people applying for the permits, the corporations seeking permits to mine, and the perm all of the permits that they need to go ahead and do that safely, there are reasons that they may want to seek more time. That provision would seem to presume that it is, our, it is our agency's jobs to permit mines. But that is not correct. Our agencies are charged with protecting the people of Minnesota, and they must reserve the power and ability and have enough time to be able to properly vet and make decisions about permit applications in the best interest of the people of our state. So again, be careful what you wish for. It's my contention that that, that, that provision in particular is not really in anybody's interest, including permittees. Uh, Amendment A32 would also add some provisions that we really need to see some very common sense things and again, these are not wild provisions. These are provisions that, that are baseline provisions. I would call them baseline provisions. They're nothing, they're not any kind of a pie in the sky thing. So uh, it would remove the preemption on, or it would add a preempt, the preemption on plastic bag ban removal. So it would allow local municipalities to make those decisions about plastic bags. Um, it would add the PCA authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. We've already heard um, <coughs> a little bit today about the climate crisis and global warming. Um, but we need to be able to regulate those emissions if we're at all, at all serious about environmental regulation and protection in, in our state. The A32 amendment, amendment would also add an MPCA downstream discharge notification requirement. It would add the solar panel stewardship program, and we've heard lots of people throughout our state, my constituents, people in industry, asking for this. We don't want to get behind. This is, this is where we're headed. The solar industry has taken off, it is taking off as we speak, and we need to have a stewardship program to help it along and to protect Minnesotans. And finally, it adds eliminating lead and cadmium in consumer products, um, which is just a very common sense thing to do. You know, there's other missed opportunities in this environmental omnibus. Um, that we know are in the governor's budget, in the administration's budget. The governor's budget addresses PFAS through community source reduction grants and studying the baseline ambient levels of PFAS in our environment. It's extremely concerning right now. We have a run in Lake Superior uh, of fish every, every time this year, and we found that there are PFAS in the fish. It's unacceptable this, with a smelt run. Um, it's also a missed opportunity that it doesn't include waste reduction and recycling grants for communities. 
Uh, it doesn't restrict the use of lead and cadmium in consumer products, which again, th my amendment would correct, the A32. Um, notifying communities when untreated wastewater is inadvertently polluting our drinking waters. I mean, really. Untreated wastewater inadvertently polluting our drink and drinking waters. We think Minnesotans deserve to know. They deserve to have notice about that so that they can protect themselves and take actions to help their communities. Also a missed opportunity is to provide technical assistance and grants to our communities for updating their wastewater treatment systems. Again, basic baseline stuff not included in this environmental omnibus bill. And then lastly, the baseline investments in trees, forests, natural lands, our native grasses to increase natural carbon sequestration. And again, provide Minnesotans and preserve healthy, clean air. Um, so with that, Mr. President, um, uh, uh, I will rest. And I ask for your support on the A32 amendment. And I would request a roll call. Roll call, <clears throat> roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, um, I'm not going to go on real long about this. I probably should just say no uh, and vote no for this. But it does, does merit some comments. And I, I appreciate the Senator's passion about uh, what's being referred to, I think, at the national level, the New Green Deal, which seems to be creeping into Minnesota all over the place. This is going to eliminate uh, everything that the uh, business community uh, is looking for. An environmental review timeline, it will, it will, take, it will remove that. It will remove uh, uh, chemical, chemical plastic recycling. You know, if you really care about that. Uh, it adds uh, solar panel, panel uh, 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 recycling. You know, I think I'm, you know, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with trying to figure out what we're going to do with these solar panels and what we're going to do with the blades on the, on the wind energy uh, uh, situation that we have. I think right now somebody's stockpiling them. They just don't know what to do with them. Kind of like batteries for cars, cars batteries. What are we going to do with all this stuff? Uh, the MPCA gives them the ability to, to, to regulate greenhouse gases. Well, um, they're doing a pretty, pretty decent job of that. We've done some funding before where we have uh, monitors throughout the throughout the cities and throughout the different areas where there's problem at, problems coming from. The word missed opportunities is just amazing to me. I've been hearing nothing, nothing else. It's been missed opportunities. Nine point five billion dollars in the bank, and we're going to miss opportunities by spending more money to grow government. That's what's going on. Wastewater treatment. Democrats have voted against wastewater treatment initiatives for a long time. We have many different fixes for that. A lot of wastewater, a lot of small towns, as well as big towns, large towns. Those wastewater facilities are coming due. What a better way to clean your environment up than spend money on wastewater treatment facilities. But the Democrats don't want to do that. That's confusing. So members, um, we are not polluting the environment with this bill. We are not killing off fish. Uh, we are not eliminating people from swimming in water. Uh, we had a beautiful. We have a beautiful, beautiful lake. We have some some lakes that are that are impaired but are being worked on. Actually, some lakes that were impaired being taken off the impaired list. So we're doing well. Wasn't that long ago I asked somebody about the big river system in the state of Minnesota? How is that now compared to back in the 90s? They said it's just amazingly better. It's amazingly better, and it's because of the work that's been coming out of this body, uh, and as well as the individuals themselves stepping up and doing recycling and whatnot. So, uh, members, again, a a red vote on on this amendment. Thanks, Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of the A32 amendment. Uh, I agree with my colleague, Senator McEwen, that we have a lot of missed opportunities in this bill. And in fact, with a $9 billion surplus, I'm happy to spend uh, some of that money to further support our parks, our environment, uh, work towards clean, 
clean, clean energy, et cetera. But specifically, I rise uh, just to point out one issue. In section 45 of the bill, um, we have an allowance for septic tanks to be simply repaired, even when the holes in the tanks are below the water level. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, ever seen a septic tank after it gets pulled out. Uh, sanitary sewage is quite corrosive, and uh, it can actually eat through the concrete. My concern with over 500,000 septic tanks in Minnesota, 30% of our population using septic tanks for their sanitary sewage treatment, that this language is not very tight, uh, just allowing for these tanks to be uh, simply repaired without any standards or, or tighter specifications makes me think that, in fact, yes, we are going to see quite a bit of uh, damage to our surface waters and our groundwater. Uh, we saw this on the bonding bill, there's a, or on the bonding tour. City of Wilder is requesting $4 million for an interceptor because all of the septic tanks in their town are corroded and failing. I think if we ignore some of the tighter standards around septic tank treatment, construction, and rehabilitation. Uh, we're going to see a lot of problems in our wastewater, or I mean in our surface waters. This is just one of the many issues that I have with this bill, and I encourage a yes vote on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebretson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, um, and thank you for. Uh, for those comments, I, I'm wondering if Senator, Senator Rarick would, would come forward and, and comment about on the, uh, uh, the amendment that she's talking about with regards to the uh, taking out the, the amendment that, about tanks. And you, you're very, you've done a lot of work on that if you'd like to broaden, your, uh, broaden the, the members' uh, scope on how to understand that. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. And Yes, I was brought up this provision about uh, repairing a septic tank, and we act, and some of the discussion has been around the idea that there's an inability to repair a septic tank that's had a little quarter inch hole drilled in it so that water would drain out of it um, when it is not installed before the end of the season, where it would sit through the winter and potentially have uh, Integr or the integrity of the tank damaged by freezing uh, moisture inside of it. And I don't want to get into too much of the detail, but you know, there's a mastic system that's put around the top and the lid is put on, and that's waterproof. And so one of the methods for repairing this is to use some mastic and put a plug in the bottom of the tank there's been testing done to show that this will last forever, it's not going to leak, and yet MPCA at this point refuses to engage and look at the testing and work with us to say that a tank can be repaired and still be installed in the ground and it's going to be safe. This provision is, say, it is not dictating one type of repair, and we believe that through rulemaking they can determine what is legitimate and not, but it's telling them that there are methods that can repair the tank and they have to look at that and they have to do that. And I know one of the things I guess it gets a little frustrating for me is in the construction trades, and one of the arguments was, well, we don't know the hole could be drilled too big and this plug is not going to work. We could look around this capital, members, there are a number of things hanging from the walls that are probably held up with what is called a plastic anchor. You drill a quarter inch hole and you insert a plastic anchor and when a screw is screwed into it, it can hold up to 35 pounds. I suppose one could say nothing hanging on the walls is safe because if somebody drilled that hole too big, the anchor will not work. That's true. But basically you're telling people out in the trades you don't know what you're doing and we can't trust you when you say that this is impossible and we can't even begin to consider that repairing a tank is possible and that it will not cause harm to the environment. Members, this is a common sense provision and it should be remaining in the bill. Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Senator Rarick. 
Uh, just respectfully, as another passionate member of the construction industry, I ask all my members, as they leave today, to look at any pavement they pass over. We don't build bituminous or concrete pavements with cracks. They start out as a hairline crack. And over time, water gets in. And I don't know about you, but I've seen plenty of cracks that are bigger than a hairline, maybe a quarter inch, an inch, two inches. I see total pavement failures that start from inappropriate sealing of a crack. And I don't see any difference between a crack or a hole. If water gets in there and freezes, it expands, and that's what causes the crack. My concern, and with total respect for the trades, is that there's no provision in here for how that uh, repair can happen, and with over half a million septic tanks in Minnesota, I don't want to leave that to uh, the goodwill of my uh, trades friends. So thank you for letting me clarify. Secretary will take the roll on the A32 amendment. I call Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderfer Anderson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Lang votes no. Lang votes no. On Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Uh, Champion votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. All members having voted with the desired vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 27 ayes and 37 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Bingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, for, for years, whether it's been uh, on a city council or in the other body here, um, there's been one issue uh, that has continuously um, been an issue and it um, really has impacted our water and our communities and that's PFAS. And those are the forever chemicals, Mr. President, that uh, were disposed of by a, a certain company in, in the state. And what it did is leached into our drinking water and into our surface water, into actually humans and into because of consumption in animals. It is a big problem. It is a big problem that we have spent a lot of time, energy, money on, um, and yet we still can't get simple things through uh, to address this situation. In order to clean it up, Mr. President, you have to stop the PFAS coming into the system. So uh, what, what I would like to do is I would like to offer the A47 amendment Secretary will report the A47 amendment. Senator Bigham moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 63 after line 12, insert. This is the A47 amendment. To the A47 amendment, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President, and I would request a roll call. Roll call is requested, roll call granted. Senator Bigham. So 
part of the remediation of this is not only replacing our water treatment and, and water systems in for residential areas, whether that's wells or um, municipal uh, wells, private wells or municipal wells, um, but we need to remove this from the consumer line. And so what the 847 amendment does is it um, prohibits um, uh, PFAS in uh, apparel, ski wax, cookware, cosmetics, um, commercial furnishings, residential and commercial furnishings, um, such as couches, um, and then also uh, prohibiting it in um, juvenile products. And what I mean by that are products made for, for children under 12, like bassinets and cribs, and the mattresses uh, that are in, in uh, those fur that furniture. The other thing we have to do, so first of all, to remove it out of our system, we, we can't allow the products that it exists in to be in our system. Then we also have to uh, test for it and, and make sure that we know if there are companies that are using this and disposing of it, that we know about that. And so what it does, it does delete um, section 77, which um, doesn't allow the MPCA to um, essentially test for it uh, unless it's borne by the MPCA. And I have to say the, the MPCA has done a tremendous job on this issue, and I want to give them credit. Um, uh, current commissioner and then the previous commissioner have, and their staff have done a tremendous job of putting together a, a PFAS blueprint, and uh, this is it's part of it. I mean, we got to remove these products from um, the system and then we also have to test for it to remediate for it. There is just not one single approach to it, but we can't not deal with this on the supply side. And so I ask for members' support on this amendment. To the A47 amendment, Senator Ingeretson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I was gonna put this thing to my ear. <laughs> it's getting to be a long day, sorry. Uh, members, I, uh, I'd ask for a red vote on this. Members, we, and Senator Bigham is, is totally, not totally incorrect when she says uh, that the uh, MPCA is certainly paying attention to PFAS. They really are. Uh, however, there's a, a, uh, uh, a state of Minnesota has a PFAS blueprint already. A uh, PFAS monitoring plan has been started. It's already started with the MPCA. Uh, $600,000 last year for stakeholder groups on PFAS in landfills and wastewater plants. There's that wastewater thing again. And this year we have a lot of money. I don't know the exact number, but we have a lot of money for PFAS uh, in the LCCMR. So uh, I would ask the, uh, the author to, uh, to consider that before we move forward here. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to ask for a red vote. Uh, but we are spending a lot of money on PFAS. And it may not be enough, I guess, according to some, but nevertheless, we are. We're not totally turning our head because the MPCA is looking at it, but it, it, needs to be, uh, it needs to be looked at and it takes a little bit of time. You're talking a lot of things. The business industries are, are having to weigh in on this as well and, and right now it's, uh, uh, it's something that needs a lot more work. So, and that's exactly what we're doing at LCCMR. Secretary will take the roll on the A47 amendment.
On Senator Duckworth's report, members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazalka votes no. Gazalka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Lang votes no. Lang votes no. Call Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And I report Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Dreheim votes no. Dreheim votes no. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. I'm sorry, 31 ayes and 34 nays, the, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to revisit the CWD issue. I think it's too too serious to not try and address the issue. If, we, if the members are not ready to say we should just end the practice of deer farming in Minnesota, I uh, have the A58 amendment at the desk, which I'd be glad to explain. The Secretary will report the A58 Senator amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 13 after line 3. Insert this to the A58 amendment. To the A58 amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Members, this one does not end the practice of deer farming in Minnesota, but it, it is still recognizing the seriousness of the threat. Senator Lang, I believe, earlier told me, he said, do you know how many of these cases CWD positive tests have been at deer farms, and he said one. According to the DNR, it's 12. It's 12 out of less than 200 herds. 12 out of less than 200 herds. The test the DNR has been doing in the last couple of decades, it's less than 0.15%. That's what they're finding in the wild herds. Virtually one out of every 600 or 700 deer testing positive. In these farms, they found it in 12 out of less than 200 farms. I think we have to recognize the seriousness of this. So the A58 amendment does three things. One is it would create a moratorium on creating new survey farms for white-tailed deer. And the second one would be that it continues the, what I had tried earlier, the, um, limitation on importing white-tailed deer um, from other states and moving them around in the state. So it would be allowing them to continue operating, but again, as um, Senator Bigham pointed out, the Deer Hunters Association, 500,000, there are half a million Minnesotans go deer hunting. There are 175 of these farms. They're heavily disproportionately cause of the spread of this disease. We have to do something now. I urge your support ask for a roll call and say, please, if it was too far to say you don't want to shut them down, then at least put the moratorium on and stop the movement of the wild, of the herd, of the farm deer. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Inger Bretson. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Marty. I'm going to, again, give uh, Senator Westerman an opportunity. He's been putting more time into this, and, and I think he'll bring uh, more, uh, more clarity to the, uh, to the amendment. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, members, uh, there's not much difference between this amendment and the last amendment. Uh, uh, Senator Marty uh, talked about the Deer Hunters Association. And uh, members, I just want to set the record straight. I've heard from our staff who'd heard from representatives of the Deer Hunters Association on the last amendment. And uh, this being very similar, they were not in support of the last amendment. So uh, that was 
erroneous, uh, if, as, as I understand it, on the floor. That uh, was not accurate information. They are not pushing or advocating for this shutting down our deer farmers in the state. And Senator, Senator Marty, uh, maybe you can just explain the difference. It looks to me that you're just banning new family farms and leaving the existing family farms. Is that the primary difference in this amendment, if you would yield for a question, Mr. President? He will yield. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom, this is, this is a moratorium on new ones. It's not banning the existing ones. And, and the, my mention of the, deer farm, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association got an article from last, last summer, Field and Stream, which it says the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association kicked the beehive when it called for an end to deer farming in the state last week. They were calling for an end to it. I'm not calling for an end to it in this one. We're not going that far. We're just saying you can't import them. You can't start new farms. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, members. To ban new farming opportunities in our state, specialty crop farmers, niche farming, traditional farming, we want to promote agriculture opportunity in our state. I was just out at the steak cookout that the Cattlemen's are doing on the front Capitol lawn today. Many of you were there. Talking to our Ag Commissioner, Tom Peterson. And Senator Marty, members, one of the topics we were talking about was methods in the drought relief package to allow smaller niche farmers to qualify and get started in our state. And so while we're trying to promote agriculture opportunities in our state, this amendment would say slam the door on new family farm opportunities. Slam the door on farmers that are going to change the livestock they've raised, maybe cattle, maybe beef, maybe dairy, and change their barns to raising deer. It's not an easy job, but some are up to it. And Senator Marty, there is no real connection that our family farms that are raising deer are the cause of CWD or somehow causing this great spread. We've spent hours hearing this in the Ag Committee. There is multiple CWD sightings in the wild. We have avian influenza in our state right now. We can't stop it. It's being spread by the wild birds flying in the pathway. So are we going to end all poultry farming so we can stop this spread of avian influenza? I don't think so. It's illogical. We've got CWD in the wild, the state to our east, with a third of their deer, wild deer, mind you, reported to being tested positive for CWD. The testimony we had is the hunting hasn't been affected in Wisconsin. While many might not want to eat CWD, many do eat it either unknowingly or eat it knowing that there's been no reports of CWD having negative health effects on humans. It doesn't transfer according to the experts that were in front of our committee. And so, Senator Marty, there might be a lot more we need to continue researching, but to shut down f new family farm opportunities is going way too far. And it's like using a hammer to fix a hangnail. Or Senator Marty, something that's even, it's not connected to the spread of CWD that we know of. This isn't a solution. Now controlling it, we have a board of animal health that has a very reputable past history and very well respected by I think most livestock, most farmers, most legislators. 
This is the type of active disease they continue to work on. There's active diseases that travel in livestock, pigs, cattle, poultry. That's why we have a Board of Animal Health. But we don't set a standard that we're not going to have any diseases or we're going to shut everything down. Because that's not reality. And so we've got the experts in place. We try to mitigate, we try to prevent, we try to resolve issues as reasonable as we can. But we know tuberculosis hits livestock at times. We know there's swine diseases that have hit our livestock and pig farmers from time to time. We know avian flu, unfortunately, hits from time to time. And sometimes you have to run its course with nature. But that's what we have a Board of Animal Health for. And in this case, we have a DNR and a Board of Animal Health. We've given concurrent authority to help even tighten up regulations, help make sure the deer farmers have good fences to keep the separation from the wild, and prevent everything we can prevent. But Senator Marty, let's not take it out on the farmers and the new family farmers that might be coming up. I can think of some of those that testified on our committee. Some were a little grayer in the hair than I am. And some of them had young sons or daughters coming back into the farm they talked about. Senator Marty, you're saying no, no new farmers. Members, let's vote no. Let's keep agriculture opportunity equal for all, whether you're a niche livestock farmer or a traditional livestock farmer. Members, just as a reminder, according to Mason's comments should be made to the president and not gone directly to other members. It's a decorum issue that uh, we do need to hold to here, here in the Senate. Senator Bingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, we're caring so much about niche farmers, and I have a bunch of hemp bills, industrial hemp bills, that didn't get any traction this year in this body. But in the other body, it did. So if we want to focus on niche farmers, we, we have some bills that, that maybe the committee would want to hear. Mr. President, if you go to the Minnesota Deer Hunters website, you will clearly be able to see that um, the MDHA support requiring double fencing. We don't have that on these surrogate farms. We don't have that. We have double gates, Mr. President. We do not have double fencing. Um, mandatory depopulation for any positive uh, cases in the farms. Moratorium on any new servant farms and voluntary buyout. And Mr. President, because we can't read, and that was my memory, um, I, I'm going to stop there because we can only read bills, Mr. President, not from anything else. Um, so clearly, the largest deer hunters uh, organization supports this, and we have to do something on it. The uh, amendment has changed. It is better. I think it's palatable. We need to do this and um, would appreciate members' support. Vote green. So, Senator Bingham, just a comment to that. It is not a proper decorum to read a speech as a particularly written by someone else. However, if you have your own notes and you have your, I'm not begging you to talk additionally, but if you have your own notes, uh, if you have a paraphrase, if you have commentary, you have a paragraph that somebody said, that is within the bounds of, of Masons. What we're trying to avoid here would be to take out a 20-page speech and deliver it for an hour and a half. I think there's a, there's a subtle difference between the two, and I think you recognize that. Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President, and I rise in support of the Marty Amendment. It's a very modest and reasonable uh, limit set on just expanding new imports to this industry, about which we should have grave concerns. Uh, we've been told that CWD occurs in both farmed animals and animals in the wild, but it simply makes common sense that animals that are kept in congregate settings, any beast kept in congregate settings, would be at higher risk to transmit illness. These illnesses are prion illnesses. They're not bacteria. They're not viruses. They are these mysterious prions that live in the soil and then move between creatures and live for very long periods, against which we have no medical 
therapies. Members, no medical therapies. If this disease was ever to make the leap to humans in a substantial way, it would be a disaster. We should treat this with the respect it deserves and simply follow the Marty lead of limiting further imports and expansion of this farming and congregate uh, deer herding industry in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it was pointed out that this will be infringing on agricultural opportunities in this state, but these farms are not agricultural opportunities, they are recreational opportunities for individuals who want to hunt. Uh, so I would argue against the, the idea that this is uh, infringing on agricultural expansion. Senator Ingebretson. Yes, Mr. President, thank you. Um, members, I know there's a little bit of confusion here, but I, I have not made any comment on this particular amendment. I'm against this amendment, so please vote red. Uh, Senator Westrom has, has uh, I think, e explained it uh, very properly. And members, you under have to understand, we've spent millions of dollars on research uh, on CWD, and it's actually working. The University of Minnesota is coming up with some real good science, some real good ways of testing. So uh, this body can, can thank themselves for the, uh, for the progress that we've been making. But vote no. Senator Marty. Mr. President, uh, just one more point of clarification, because Senator Westrom was saying how, how it's extensive in the wild herd. Again, it's less than 0.15%, not 10%, not 5%, 0.15% of the tested wild herd, which tend to be around situations where it's been exposed, they found CWD. In the deer farms, 179 or 175, whatever number I quoted earlier that we have, maybe we were 200 a couple years ago, there have been 12 cases. That's 7%. 7% of our herds, the farmed herds, have been. And again, on the deer hunters, while the Deer Hunters Association has called for an end to deer farming in the state, this, this amendment does not. It does call for three other things that they've asked for, a ban on any in-state and interstate movement, a moratorium on new deer farms, and those are things that we are proposing here. We're not proposing to end the industry. We're simply proposing these urgently needed changes on the cause, the biggest cause of the spread of this in Minnesota, because it's showing up in new parts of the state because of the movement of wild herds, of farmed herds. Urge your support. Secretary will take the roll on the A58 amendment. I call on Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes nay. I call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. 
I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Lang votes no. Lang votes no. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 33 nays, the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President um, and members. I'm really pleased to bring this amendment to you. Uh, this amendment aims to address some of the environmental concerns uh, around soil and water contamination, and it really has a potential and enormous uh, risk or liability on landowners, our children, and um, the, our future grandchildren. At this time, the state of Minnesota um, has no plan to deal with abandoned pipelines. And it's actually quite a dangerous situation. Um, and it also does not protect our landowners from liability. So today I am asking all of us to come together and take action so that our individuals do not have to face the concerns that we have been hearing um, alone. So just imagine that you've got this piece of land and um, there is somewhere buried in your land uh, an old pipeline. And you decide that you want to build on your property somewhere and you start to, to go uh, dig in the place that you want to, to build your foundation and you hit an old pipeline a pipeline that's been laying there for years and years, and the area around that pipeline is, is overgrown and the signage has faded or fallen away, uh, what do you do when you hit that pipeline that's been abandoned? Well, you can call somebody, an organization or a business that um, is a specialty in removal of old pipelines, or you can call the original owners, the original company that put that pipeline in. And there's a story that I've heard about uh, an individual, a family that wanted to build on their land, hit that pipeline, and contacted uh, a business near them. And the guy said, yeah, we can take those out. We do that every so often. It'll probably cost you about $1,000. Well, it turned out that they actually also needed permission from the original pipeline layer, the company. And so they contacted the, the um, original owners of those pipelines, and the pipeline said, well, we have to give you permission to do that, first of all, and then you have to use whoever we say uh, you, you can use to have that pipeline removed. And instead of costing $1,000 for that pipeline to be removed, it, um, the other company, the, comp the pipelines company, um, quoted them at $50,000. $50,000 to remove 300 feet of an old pipeline. So that landowner um, ultimately decided it wasn't worth it. He didn't want to get into litigation, all of that stuff. And so he sold the property rather than deal with that pipeline. And so across our state, we are finding that there are pipelines that are lying in the ground. And um, we know that uh, there are some uh, issues around those pipelines laying in the ground. I have a list right here. There are 419 entries on this spreadsheet with 10,570 miles a pipeline that lay under the ground in Minnesota. That's enough pipes to go from Minneapolis to, um, to Baton Rouge, or Minneapolis to Atlanta, or uh, Minneapolis to Dover. And that's Dover, Pennsylvania, not Dover, England. So that's what's laying under the grounds here in Minnesota. 
So with that 3,000, um, with those, that over 10,000 miles of pipeline, there's also 3 million miles of natural gas pipelines buried across the United States. And that moves the fuel between the drilling sites and the storage facilities, power plants, and homes. But more than half of all the gas transition lines in the United States were, instilled, were um, installed previous to 1970. And the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration uh, thinks that the average lifespan of a pipeline is 50 years old. That means we have many, many, many miles of aging pipeline, not just across the United States, but across our state. So it's not just those old pipelines that are set to go out of service. A lot of the younger pipelines, ones that we've even seen recently and been hearing about um, issues, are also at risk of falling into disuse as the power sector comes to rely less on natural gas and in favor of wind, solar, and, battery, and um, batteries. So what do we do with all these pipelines that are laying under the ground? I don't know if any of you have lands that have these pipelines running through, and if you've ever had a thought like, what are we gonna do with that? What, how are we gonna deal with it? Are we gonna just leave it in there? That's not a good idea because there is an extensive um, study, and this comes out of Canada that has even more pipelines running through it, um, that identify a lot of risks to leave them in place. Sinkholes could form as pipelines corrode and collapse. The leftover fossil fuel, and even though there are, will be claims that there's nothing left in those pipes, um, that they're clear, Oftentimes they are not, or they could fill up with soil and water from around you. Senator Kudish, uh, I know you want to debate your amendment. Could we report the amendment? And could sure. you move the amendment? Then we can continue with your comments. It's sure. better form for us to get the amendment in front of the body. Excellent suggestion. It's a very simple one. Um, so members, I would like to share with you the A31 amendment. Senator Kunish moves the A31 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Kunish moves to amend House file number 4062 as follows, page 70 after line 24, insert. This is the A31 amendment. To the A31 amendment, Senator Kunish. Thank you. Mr. President. Um, so as I was saying, sinkholes can form, leftover fossil fuel or cleaning agents could leak into the surrounding soil and water. Um, there are aging lines under lakes and rivers that could carry water where it is not wanted. For example, a 36-inch pipeline that is laying under the ground could drain an entire lake in a relatively short time. And that would end up sending that lake, that water, somewhere else. And those folks that are downhill, I don't think would really appreciate having a lake in their backyard. Those empty pipelines also become slightly buoyant. And their relatives to soil, they rise to the surface. Uh, when there was a, a, a investigation on the old Line 3 pipeline, I saw so many pictures of how the land around it, especially if they were near creek beds, eroded away. So now these pipelines are above the ground and are, um, are exposed to the elements and the decay. So let's say that a pipeline goes into the ground around 60 years ago and that land gets passed down from generation to generation. Maybe it's a farmland. Maybe it's a, a, a recreational lands that we are, we've been talking about. By the time it gets to the next generation, the grandkids or the great grandkids, we have now left this legacy of old decaying pipelines to them. And I feel that it is our responsibility it's our uh, moral responsibility, it's our fiscal responsibility, and it's our state responsibility that we address uh, that so that the generations coming behind us don't have to worry about that. So um, uh, I would like to um, offer this amendment, this uh, A31 amendment. 
uh, making sure that we don't have leaking abandoned pipelines like what happened in Colorado. There was an old gas line. It still had fuel in it and caused an explosion that left uh, two dead and others seriously injured. And the investigators later realized that there was, uh, that that line was actually still connected but to the near, nearby gas uh, line as well. Mr. President, point of order. Senator Ingebrigtsen, please state your point of order. Uh, under Rule 35, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, this bill is, is not uh, does not pertain to the uh, statute that uh, the senator is talking about, and that's 21, excuse me, 216G.13. It is not in our bill, so therefore I don't believe it's germane. Mm -hmm. To that point of order, germaneness. Um, Discussion to the germaneness of the amendment. Senator Kunish. Yes. Um, well, I think we have heard plenty of um, things that have uh, were not in this bill, and as in an omnibus bill, apparently it is. Uh, it is. Uh, we are able to um, add our amendments. This certainly has to do with the environment, the environment of the past, the environment of the present, and the environment of the future. I'm almost done here, but um, I would ask that you find this amendment germane to the environmental bill as it does affect the, uh, the environment. Further advice to the point of germaneness. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, if you take a look at the bill, you can see that this bill is very, very um, broadly construed. It is far flung. It has many, many disparate measures that affect um, DNR policy, PCA policy, Bowser policy, every aspect of, of environmental appropriation and policy that you could possibly imagine. Um, and this would be in keeping with uh, the underlying bill. It would be very, very consistent with uh, how broadly construed this omnibus bill is. Thank you. Further advice? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. As I look at the rule, uh, it states a non-germane amendment includes one that relates to a substantially different subject or really is intended to accomplish a substantially different purpose. As uh, Senator Dibble and Senator Kunish have both expressed, uh, this bill today dealing with the environment contains many, many, many provisions and the amendment that Senator Kunish has brought forward uh, does not relate to a substantially different subject. It relates dire directly to the environment and uh, the clean environment that we hope for. She's made that case strongly. Uh, the amendment does not substantially, uh, does not change the purpose of the proposal. In fact, it supports the, the, pr the proposal that Senator Ingebrigtsen has brought to the floor, and therefore the amendment is germane. Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the uh, face sheet of our bill talks about this being an environment, natural resource, and tourism uh, subject matter bill. And uh, uh, were it uh, uh, a bill that dealt with energy or something like this, I think it would be germane, but certainly I don't think it meets the, the general themes that this uh, particular bill uh, intends to meet. Thank you. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. And this is clearly public utilities commission law, not environment law. I've made my decision on the rule of point of order, and the point of order is well taken. Senator Kunish. I would like to challenge that, that ruling. This absolutely has to do with the environment. This is an environmental uh, omnibus bill. This bill asks that uh, we remove pollutants from the environment. Senator Kunish, this is not the time to debate. It's the, this is an opportunity for you to challenge the ruling. It's not to challenge the decision of this president. So I think you need to have the correct answer 
or the correct question, which is you challenge the ruling of the chair and ask for a roll call vote. Thank you. Senator Kunish challenges the ruling of the president, requests a roll call vote. A green vote sustains the decision of the president. The, a red vote overrules the decision of the president. The secretary will take the roll. I call Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes yes. Anderson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes yes. Benson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes yes. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes yes. Johnson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes yes. Miller votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes yes. Rosen votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes yes. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Lang votes yes. Lang votes aye. Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes no. Champion votes no. Senator Friends. Or Senator Clausen votes no. Clausen votes nay. Senator Friends. Senator Kent votes no. Kent votes nay. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes no. Newton votes no. nay. Senator Friends. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes nay. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 29 nays, the decision of the president is sustained. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, members. Uh, Mr. President, members, the simple fact as we live here today in Minnesota and debate this bill is that climate change, or as we've discussed in committee, climate chaos is here. We are experiencing the consequences to our lives every single day. And as bad as both droughts and floods are, severe storms, and uh, Mr. Chair, I think I'll have the pages bring a handout around. Uh, we had tornadoes in December. This has never happened ever in the history of our state. Tornadoes in December. Loss of habitat, species loss, insect outbreak, food and water insecurity, extreme weather disasters, decline in our public health, species loss and extinctions, vector-borne diseases, as bad as we think those things may be, and the increases that we're experiencing now, we know that they're going to get worse. The question is, how much worse? And what are we going to do, and what will it take to rein in our greenhouse gas emissions? Just a week or two ago, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, issued a dire warning. They've issued dire warnings before. This one should get our attention. We have two years, one legislative cycle, to turn the corner dramatically and drastically to ensure that our emissions start coming down, down after 2025. That's one legislative cycle. Members, the debate is over. To fail to act now is to say we either don't care or our democracy is controlled by the powerful fossil fuel industries, or we just give up. Members, the generations from whom we inherit this amazing, beautiful, successful state didn't give up. They worked hard. They overcame the odds. They made a great place for us to live. So I'm wondering, members, why we don't feel the same obligation to our children and grandchildren. I just, members, I just don't get it. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A33 amendment. 
The Secretary will report the A33 amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 60 after line 23, insert. This is the A33 amendment. To the A33 amendment, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a very simple amendment. It's uh, many pages long, but really the only new language you find is on page one. Uh, and it simply says that the PCA, in addition to um, its existing responsibilities to the public, to our welfare, to the people of this state, is that they would also consider greenhouse gas emissions uh, when they're considering uh, the sorts of things that people are, that industry and others are proposing to do as they're permitting pollution in our state. Mr. President, I'd like to request a roll call. Thank you. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would ask the, a, a for red vote on the A33 amendment. Members, this gives the PCA total regulation of the greenhouse gases. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have some agencies that, are, that do a lot of good work here in the state of Minnesota. And um, the PCA, I think, in, in general, uh, certainly does and steps forward in a lot of different initiatives. However, um, uh, you know, when it, comes, when it comes to regulating greenhouse gases, it, it brings back the memory of, of uh, uh, our, our governor to wanting to, uh, wanting to uh, uh, mirror the mirror the emissions of what goes on in California with our cars. And I, and again, I, I go back to this, uh, uh, this, this idea that, you know, the sky is falling, you know? I mean, we're, 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 we're going to burn up. And I mean, there's comments like we're going to burn up in a few years if we don't do this and if we don't do that and if we don't follow this, what I think is very radical, uh, radical, Green New Deal stuff coming again out of Washington. I'm not saying, Senator Dibble, that this, you were talking locally here regulating, uh, uh, but just in general, uh, it, you know, everybody thinks that the world is falling in, and, and frankly, it's, it's not. Um, and, you know, we have scientists on both sides. I get that. I appreciate that. It all depends upon what, uh, what you want to do. But I, I caution the members in this, in this body uh, over the years to come that uh, the amount of money that's going to be spent on the environment and the scare of the world coming to an end here real soon is going to be very costly if you don't pay attention to it. It's going to be, it's going to be one of the biggest costs that we've endured, one of the biggest taxes that we could possibly put on our, our uh, citizens. We have to live in this world, folks. You know, I, I think in, in, in a state of euphoria, it would be nice to say we don't want anybody else to come to this country anymore. We don't want anybody else because we want to save our environment. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> the guy that's coming up with the greenhouse or the Green New Deal is certainly populating this, the country, isn't he? It's amazing. It's amazing how this, the hypocrisy that goes on. But nevertheless, uh, I'm really off track here, members. I, I, I would ask for a red vote. And uh, again, I, 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 I say that knowing Senator Dibble has very is very passionate about this subject, and uh, um, uh, someday we'll, we'll, we'll come to grips on that. I'm not sure in the real future, near future, but we will. And uh, uh, again, vote red. Senator Dibble? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for the amendment. I rise in support. Members, the question is not why is Senator Dibble asking what other states are doing to fight climate change. The question is why isn't the majority party in the Senate asking what other states are doing? 25 years ago, we heard, oh, climate change is a hoax. This isn't really happening. The temperature of the planet is not changing. Fast forward to today, and it is. We've had a little discussion on the floor today about how that might affect us. If you were lucky enough to be in the Senate Energy and Utility Committee at okay, maybe it's not going to start at three. You'd hear testimony today from an insurance company telling us about the billions of dollars of climate-related claims that they're paying. That's right, claims that are being paid by insurance companies. We all pay the cost of insurance. I know I've heard that in this chamber before. So there is no question that the changing temperature of the planet is costing us money. That's a fact. Come to the Energy Committee today and hear the testimony. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And I think what Senator Dibble's amendment says 
is that the pollution control agency shall improve air quality by promoting in the most practicable way possible the use of energy sources and waste disposal that produce or emit the least greenhouse gases. The PCA should improve air quality by considering which produces the least greenhouse gases. Does the Minnesota Senate, Senate stand for the idea that we want to promote more greenhouse gases? Again, I'd ask members, if we're going to have a serious debate about climate change, let's get to it. Let's have it in committee. Let's have witnesses on both sides. And let, let, let's let the public testify about what they think is important. Climate change is real. We know it. This amendment is a small step to ask the PCA to recognize it. And I'll be a yes vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of the Dibble Amendment. And uh, like Senator Frentz was alluding to in the Energy Committee today, we heard in Taxes Committee a proposal from the City of Rochester where they've tried to uh, institute some flood mitigation efforts that would prevent against a 100-year flood, prepare for a 100-year flood. Unfortunately, the City Administrator told us they've had four such 100-year floods in the last 15 years. Uh, the planet is warming and we are already spending enormous amounts of money to, to deal with that and to save our health and to save our infrastructure and to save our, our lands for our children. Uh, this is the time to start regulating greenhouse gases so it doesn't get worse uh, before it gets better. Senator Marty. Mr. President, I just wanted to respond to Senator Ingebrigtsen's statement that, well, some people being alarmist about this thing, the planet's going to burn up in a couple years. And I don't think the issue is the planet burning up. The issue is the climate heating up. And by the time your grandkids and their grandkids age, they're going to be living in a planet that they, it's nothing like what you know. The 2022 normal, the new normal, they say, is not the new normal. It's the current normal, and it's getting worse. And it's pretty clear evidence that the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, just tiny bits of it, 350 parts per million, is enough to be, that's the threshold what they say can stop the planet from heating up, and we're way beyond that. This is not a joke. And Senator Ingebrigtsen, you may not think it's a problem, but your grandkids and their grandkids are. And they're not going to have any choice because we're failing to do it. This amendment doesn't fix everything. It just simply says that the MPCA can regulate for this. It's a very reasonable amendment. I urge your support. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President, members. Uh, you know, one of the things that always is an issue when we talk about environmental concerns is that the problems that are coming, we often think are tomorrow's problems or there are problems somewhere else that are going to come here eventually. Uh, that's not the case when it comes to climate change. We all know that the problem is now and it is here. And you need no further evidence than the uh, last year when California was on fire because Californians came here. So if for no other reason than to keep Californians out of Minnesota, we have to stand up to climate change and make very simple interventions, very simple, reasonable ones, like the ones suggested by Senator Dibble here. This is in no sense radical. It is simply a reasonable response to a radical problem. So for that reason, uh, I support this amendment. Uh, members, when it comes to climate, it, 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 too often we say both sides and we don't adjudicate the quality of both sides. In this case, it's fairly clear. It's extremely clear that the climate problem is profound and is pressing and is immediate. Uh, this is a simple, reasonable response to a profound problem, and I urge vote members to vote green. Second. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. I just had to respond to that uh, last remark. I um, married and brought someone to Minnesota from California, so. <laughs> um, and just very quickly, um, uh, you know, to the point that Senator uh, Marty just made, um, you know, this is not hyperbolic, this is not radical, this is not the Green New Deal agenda. This is real. We're living it. The tornadoes were it's last December. We're not imagining this. You know, I'm not, you know, King Lear ranting in the desert. This is, this is real life. This is what we're experiencing. Uh, I think today Senator Senjum in his committee was going to have a presentation. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. It's pulled off the internet 
talking about what's going to happen in Minnesota and how much it's going to cost us out of our pockets, how much our insurance is going to go up, what's going to happen with the droughts that we've been experiencing, the floods that we've been experiencing, uh, the other effects. Um, members, the IPCC aren't a bunch of radical, crazy people. These are scientists from all across the entire world. There is no difference of opinion on science on this. There's maybe a couple of crazy scientists who don't know what they're talking about who doubt this, but they've been, they've been completely discredited. The science is not just the science. We are living it right now. And if we don't turn it around in two years, it's going to get worse. That's just a fact. And the world is not going to burn up, but a lot of bad stuff is going to happen. And our farmers, our industries, our forest industry, they're going to be our tourist industry. Um, and we have hearing after hearing after hearing in Senator Ingebrigtsen's committee, local communities wanting a bunch of money from all state taxpayers, my state taxpayers, for flood mitigation measures because the charts show the floods have increased by fivefold, tenfold over the past 10, 15 years where there were no floods in certain areas of the state and they want us to pay for those. That's a lot of money. That's the consequence, real money that we have to forego to do other things like, you know, I don't know, making up the special ed subsidy so that we can educate our kids and hire teachers sufficiently all across our state. So members, vote for this bill. Let's get serious. Let's stop these silly debates. There is no this side, that side. It's just the reality of what we're living. We have to turn the climate change dynamic around. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'm not going to belabor this any longer, but I, I, you know, I hear this about the greenhouse gases. It's just been just, you know, an, an amazing discussion over the years. And you sit back and listen to this, and you watch, you watch uh, people try to, uh, 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 try to address it by, by forcing windmills, by forcing uh, other uh, alternative means, and, and that's all fine so long as it works and it's, it's not cost prohibitive. Uh, most of it has been up to this point, but I think that that'll go across the line someday. But I've never heard anybody on the other side of the aisle agree with nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the cleanest energy even yet. And now they're coming up with some new technology so I, I hope in the future that those that care so much about greenhouse gases, and oh, by the way, are we going to talk about cow poop? That has been brought up, two members. Really? I mean, this is the extreme, folks. I'm talking, talking the extreme from one end to the other. And, and if the PCA is going to go around and monitor that, if nothing else, that'll give you an idea why you should read a, rule, rule against this, this particular amendment, because it's going to give them way too much power to go around and, and uh, uh, do what they're, what they're sometimes accused of doing, and that's being heavy-handed. So vote no. Senator Johnson-Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I was speechless before, and now I'm even more speechless that we're bringing up uh, energy from cow poop on the Senate floor. Uh, the fact that I even heard with my own ears on the Senate floor that there's a question of if climate change is real floored me. Uh, over 10 years ago, I worked with uh, Mark Seeley. Some of you know, may know him. He was a state climatologist for years. Uh, Dr. Seeley? I think he's a doctor. He and I worked together on a report that documented the millions of dollars the Minnesotan construction industry was having to spend to mitigate the realities of climate change. That was 11 years ago. I can only imagine how many more millions we're spending now. So to say there's both sides of the issue, that language is oddly familiar, that there's very good uh, people on both sides. I really don't believe there is. I really believe that this is solid and we need to support Senator Dibble's amendment to show that we are reasonable, scientifically based people in the Minnesota Senate, and I thank him for the amendment. Thank you very much. The sec Secretary will take the roll on the A33 amendment.
Call Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes no. Senator Duckworth. And Senator Lang votes no. Lang votes nay. How does Senator Duckworth vote? <laughs> Senator, I call on Senator Friends to report members voting under 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. Senator Dibble. Uh, Mr. President, never mind. Just, just as a clerical matter, because we're not under call, that does not require an individual to vote, even if they happen to be sitting at their seat. All members having voted with the desired vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 33 nays, the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, some of you may know, if you know me, that I'm an avid fisherman. I have reported on the floor numerous times that my wife thinks I have a fishing problem, and my family has a long line of hunters. I think we all know the, uh, on another hand, we all know the realities of what lead does to human beings and to living creatures, and it's uh, oftentimes uh, horrific and unhealthy, which is why we've worked so hard to get out of any environment that children would be in. Uh, whenever we get the chance. Uh, we don't like lead paint. We don't like lead anywhere near our kids because uh, it's not safe. And that is true uh, for any living creatures. And for years, I know we have used lead shot and lead tackle uh, in fishing and in hunting. And uh, the reality is, is that that has a very uh, negative effect on our environment. It's hard on our animals. It's not safe to consume. Uh, and I think that we have a responsibility to treat nature the same way we treat our home, which is to not allow for lead to be in our ammo and our, our fishing tackle because long-term effects of that are going to be continue to be negative. We see it in wildlife that have, have died from consuming lead, uh, and I think this is something that would be very common sense for us to get out of the environment as fast as we could. So I'd like to offer the A41 Amendment. Secretary will report the A41 amendment. Senator Isaacson moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows. Page 26, after line 6, insert. This is the A41 amendment. To so the Mr. A41 amendment, Senator, uh, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, I don't know, and I'm not sure if uh, a senator, my friends across the aisle, want to talk about the science of lead, if we want to have that discussion of whether it really affects people or not, but I, I think we all know that it does. There isn't a whole lot of question about that. Uh, and we also know that the lead in our environment is not good. We also know it's not good for animals. And it's just a common sense quick thing we should have done years ago that we haven't done. So I hope we can all come together and vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. Senators, Senator Ingebretson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And uh, no, I'm not going to debate whether. Kids should consume lead or not, uh, Senator. Uh, I'm not going to debate that at all. Uh, however, the lead ammunition prohibition thing has been around for, uh, for some time. Um, I kind of thought it, it had gone to rest, but I guess not. Um, uh, those of you who may or may not know that, that you know, wildlife, or excuse me, wild, waterfowl, I'm sorry, I'm getting my words mixed up, waterfowl is uh, and has to be uh, shot with steel shot, has been for years. Uh, any, any, anybody hunting on a WMA or a CNA uh, has to use steel shot for whatever bird they're hunting. Uh, but at the, uh, anything else other than that is uh, uh, lead ammunition. So um, members, there's really no, I don't know if there's a real definite, definite uh, uh, need for, for this. Uh, um, 
with, with regards to shot. I, I understand the consumption of lead in paint. I understand the consumption of lead in, in other, uh, other areas where, where kids are susceptible, but uh, I certainly, uh, I think this is not really anything to compare that with, quite frankly. Um, so I would say uh, uh, the fact of the matter is there's so much lead ammunition. And does it make it right? Probably not. But there's so much ammunition out there that this is, uh, this is not supported uh, uh, by very many people in the state of Minnesota. So I would ask for a uh, red vote. Senator Isaacson. Well, I, I'm not so sure I agree with your assessment on, on many fronts, although I'm glad we can come to agreement on children and lead paint. That's nice. Uh, I will say that uh, first, uh, Mr. President, I'd like a roll call on this. Um, roll call I, is requested, roll call granted. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll say that uh, if we know it's not good for our environment, if we just know that, I apologize if it creates an inconvenience for hunters. Sorry that you have to put up with that if we have to get rid of it. And I, and I, and I, don't, I agree with you. It isn't a good reason just because there's a lot of it out there. But there are ways we can do this to, to, get, to get the lead out of our, out of our, our guns and out of our, our fishing tackle boxes. And I think that that's something that's worthy of doing. It doesn't make a lot of sense. If we know it's bad, why would we continue to use it? I know it's economical. I know there's something to do with the, the weight of lead shot that makes it a better shooting projectile. But I'll tell you that that does not seem to weigh, in my mind, to inserting more lead into our environment. It's a pretty simple thing to do. So I, I hope you guys can see that and we can, we can uh, agree to this amendment. Thank you. Senator Klein. Mr. President, first of all, I would request that you impose a call to the Senate for the remainder of the bill. The Senate is under call. And I rise in support of the uh, Isaacson Just a second. Amendment. We have to go under call and then we'll come back to you to, to finish the call itself and then we'll come back to you. The Senator is under call. Senator Klein. Mr. President, I move that further proceedings under the call be be dispensed with. Dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms instructed to bring in the absent members. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, opposed. Motion does prevail. Aye. Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of the Isaacson Amendment. Most people who have eaten pheasant uh, have ex the experience of having, you know, spit out a little bit of shot in the process when they were younger. Uh, there are no safe levels of lead. They're certainly not safe to have lead in your mouth, especially if you're a young kid whose brain is developing uh, something that we can do that's right for kids and it's causing harm. Let's do it. Senator Root. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, I've been working on this, um, this, for, this subject for a very, very long time. And when I first started working on the non-toxic uh, ammunition, there was none, right? You go into the store and you could buy a box and it wasn't very good. The steel shot wasn't very good, it wasn't very accurate. But now you can go into, into any store and you can really find that ammunition to use. And you, you have a choice now and it's very good. And it's um, not as expensive. The, the, the argument was always, oh well, it's way too expensive to use. But now actually the non-toxic shot is in some cases cheaper. So, um, well, I, I agree with this premise. I think this is kind of using a sledgehammer in, instead of maybe a, a surgical a knife. And so, um, uh, and then also on the, on the lead tackle, you know, we, we, we did a, uh, a bill in the tax committee and we said, let's, let's give everybody a tax break if they buy um, non-toxic uh, tackle. So I went to Cabela's and I did a video in Cabela's and there's like five acres of leaded tackle, and there's one small little um, end cap 
of non-lead um, tackle. So I think the manufacturers, just like they did with lead shot, the manufacturers are now coming along and saying, yeah, we have to do this. And I think this is a little too soon and a little too heavy handed. I think the manufacturers are coming forward and they're saying, yep, we know that the, the consumers want non-leaded uh, tackle. And they're coming along that the, the selection is getting bigger and bigger. And I know that our Lakeshore associations are having um, you bring in your lead tackle and donate it, and they're taking it off the market. So there's a lot of things going on out there uh, in the marketplace with consumers and lake associations and, and all the folks that, that um, the hunting groups, they're, they're promoting the non-toxic lead. So while I, I really think this is uh, as where the, we're going, I think this amendment is just a little hev heavy-handed for, for right now. But I appreciate the, the thought of, of getting lead out of the environment, because I think going forward it is an important issue. Secretary will take the roll on the A41 amendment. Call Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Sen Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Lang votes no. Lang votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Dames votes no. Senator Dames votes no. Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 29 ayes and 36 nays, the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A49 amendment at the desk. The Secretary will report the A49 amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows, page 18, delete section 9. This is the A49 amendment. To the A49 amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a simple amendment. The section 9 of, the, of Article 2 is simply the all-terrain vehicle weight increase. I'm very concerned about the idea how much more damage 3,000 pound vehicles do to our, our natural areas. When you see all the damage that's been occurring to our wetlands, and people riding existing vehicles often inappropriately, but increasing the weight by 1,000 pounds is going to greatly increase the damage. Um, when it was proposed in Wisconsin, a similar weight increase, the Wisconsin DNR spoke about saying how they strongly opposed it saying the decision of adjusting ATV weight limits should not be driven by what machine manufacturers want, but what's best for the resource. And that's the issue we are dealing with here. It's not what some industry wants, but it's what's best for our state lands and state forests, and our state wetlands. The damage that's been happening over the years has been really outrageous to our, our lands, our forests. I think a lot of us have experienced, have seen it. The idea of just simply increasing it, we don't need it for electric vehicles. There are plenty of electric ATVs that weigh less than 2,000 pounds. I urge your support for this and ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Ingebretson. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a red vote. Um, there was discussion, I know, in the committees uh, with regards to dropping it, from, or excuse me, raising it from 2,000 to 3,000. Members, a lot of your side-by-sides now are, are well over the 2,000 limit. That's why it was brought forward. I think the bigger issue, uh, Senator Marty, and I, and I agree, the, the, uh, the amount of damage that can be done to the uh, environment uh, really 
doesn't change a whole lot whether, he, you know, if you have a th another thousand pounds on the wheels. Uh, where it changes is, is uh, when the environment gets hurt is when they get off the trails. And, and, and again, this body has been doing a very good job of putting out more and more four-wheel trailers and trails in the state uh, that, that folks can, in, can enjoy. So I will tell you that the industry, both the uh, Polaris and, and uh, uh, Articat weighed in. They're obviously in, uh, in, in, you know, in favor of it. And, and the State Trail Association, uh, those that do the four-wheeling are in favor of it as well. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Ingebrigtsen, the trouble is 3,000-pound vehicles do do far more damage. I mean, the higher the weight of the vehicle, the more damage it's going to do. I mean, a bicycle isn't going to do as much damage as something that weighs five times that much. There are a number of factors that do the damage, but the weight is a huge factor of it. And with, as the machines get more and more powerful, and we add that to the weight, they can chew up the trails faster, the erosion gets worse, the damage to wetlands, destroying wetlands, draining them because of the damage to them. This is something that the DNR has not been able to keep up with all the damage and the appropriate maintenance of the trails. We just keep expanding them every time the industry or certain people come in and say we need more. What about the forest for everybody else? What about the wetlands we're trying to preserve? The habitat. This is not something that's friendly to our natural resources. This is not something we should be allowing. And the fact that the industry wants it is not a good excuse for doing it. I strongly urge you to vote no. A vote yes for the amendment to keep it out of the bill. The secretary will take the role in the A. Senator Root. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Marty, you're probably going to be really surprised at this, but I am going to, um, I, I, support, I support the increased weight of ATVs. We, uh, when I first brought this um, uh, bill into my committee, I, I, my purpose was to show how terrible it would be to increase the weight. And as we went through the committee process and we heard the hearing and all the people that testified, I really changed my mind on this issue. Now, I don't think that we should ever go a, a, a wider ATV. I think the trails can, can handle that. But the ATV clubs themselves have come to the realization that this is not a bad idea. Um, and it's not so much the uh, ATV manufacturers, it's the user groups that are using them, these machines. And they're really fine with this added weight. And as we go forward to the electric ATVs, the batteries do a add more, more weight. Uh, they also displace. Um, how many people you can actually have on the ATV because there's, uh, the battery takes up space. And so there's only so many places for people to be on the ATV. So I think as, as you know, we're not, we used to think of the ATVs that we used to ride. And Senator Marty, you went riding with me in the Spider Hills forest when we did the damage up there. Um, not we did the damage, we looked at the damage. Um, and, and it was just the, the old ATVs where you had the handlebars and you, you went down the trail and, and you see very few of those anymore. I have two of them, but they're workhorses that we use on the land. But now most people have the gators, the side-by-sides, and they're using them for families and the families go for rides. And actually when you think of that, it puts actually less machines on the trail. Because when my husband and I go riding, we each have a machine on the trail and we each go down that trail. But now the new gators, you're going to have your family. So instead of maybe two to three machines with kids on them, you're going to have one machine and that gator. And so that extra weight, I think, really makes, makes sense for family riding and actually keeping less ATVs on the trail as we go forward. So um, I really do support this new weight. It surprises me, too, because I, I didn't think I would. But uh, after hearing the testimony in committee, um, I think it's a good idea. Secretary will take the role on the A49 amendment.
Call on Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes no. Anderson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes no. Benson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes no. Gazelka votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes no. Miller votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes nay. Senator Duckworth. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Duckworth. Senator Dames votes no. Dames votes no. Call on Senator Frentz to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes aye. Champion votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Isaacson votes aye. Isaacson votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Kent votes aye. Kent votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Frentz. And Senator Port votes aye. Port votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 26 ayes and 39 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A25 amendment. Secretary will report the A25 amendment. Senator Jasinski moves to amend Senate file number 4062 as follows. Page 18 after line 4. Insert. This is the A25 amendment. To the A25 amendment, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We've had a long day, and I hope we can end on a positive note with, a, with an amendment you might find either humorous or ironic, but I'm going to offer a snowmobile amendment today. Uh, this uh, has to do with snowmobile safety. I see you're all laughing and smiling. That's good, but that's the way the end of the day's uh, been going to a good weekend. But uh, the A25 amendment, what it does, uh, as we've seen lots and more and more of these roundabouts that we're seeing across the state, uh, comes across an issue with uh, snowmobile crossing. Uh, so what this does is uh, in a crossing or a divided highway, the crossing in a, uh, made only at an intersection of such highway with a, another public street highway or at a safe location approved by the road authority. So again, you're supposed to cross at the intersection with the roundout about, it makes it much more difficult. So what this allows is for the road authority to say where that crossing can be. So uh, with that, I hope you uh, would have a green vote on the amendment today. And I hope you find some humorous going into the weekend uh, with me offering a snowmobile amendment. Thank you. Senator Ingebrigtsen. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. President. I don't see the safety uh, portion of this in here, but. Uh, I do. Uh, I do agree that this is a this is a good amendment. It's a friendly amendment, and we should be crossing the road safely. So uh, this addresses that. To the A25 amendment, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, if uh, Senator Jasinski or Senator Newman would yield. Senator Dibble, which one would you like? Uh, Senator Jasinski, who is the vice chair of our transportation committee. He and will the, yield. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Uh, just a simple question. Again, you know, it looks like we're doing a little committee work here. It doesn't look like a terrible idea. It may be a brilliant idea. Um, but uh, is, have we checked in with uh, Senator Newman and or um, MnDOT or, or any other transportation experts to let us know that this is, in fact, although I don't doubt your brilliant Senator Jasinski, that this is a good idea. To your brilliant Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Dibble. Uh, this was brought to be by, this, by the Snowmobile Group. Uh, to my understanding, they have uh, peace in the valley on this, and it does uh, make common sense to, uh, otherwise you'd have to change, or you would have to cross the road at the roundabout. Uh, again, this just uh, designates the road to be where it can be done by the road authority. So I think it's a, a good bill, and I believe it has support by all uh, Groups. To the A25 amendment, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. The secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 4062, a bill for an act relating to state government appropriating money for environment and natural resources and tourism. Third reading. Further discussion. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, members. Today was a good day, and I felt very good to be a member of the minority. Thank you, members, for the time and energy 
that you put today into designing amendments that really will improve this bill. But I believe that we made a very clear statement today, and I think Minnesotans know the contrast between the majority and the minority. We have it on record. Thank you. So I would like to encourage all of you to vote against Senate File 4492. You just heard from the chair of the committee and the members of the majority that this bill basically does three things. The first thing that it does, and they're very proud of it, is that it creates an account that takes money from a fund that was intended to fund environmental, bill, environmental programs, and it, they use it to promote sports events. That's the main highlight of this bill. We're gonna promote sport, sports events with a you know, uh, million dollars. That's the investment that we're making today. But what is more important about this bill, members and the public and Mr. President, is that this bill actually includes only projects very small projects, mainly trails, in Republican districts. And then, which is, this is the most problematic part that we really try, the minority members really try to change this, is that it limits the ability of the Pollution Control Agency, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and the Department of Natural Resources from doing their job. Their job is to enforce rules to protect our land, our water, our forest, our mineral resources, and the air that we breathe. What this bill does is that it limits their work. Democrats in the minority tried to change this bill in committee. We were not given that opportunity. We don't have the votes to change that and what, that's what we, we really want to tell today, we wanted to tell today to our young people, to the people in Minnesota who we know agree with us, that we're trying and we try to change this bill today, but we don't have the votes to do it. The majority gave you a message, people in Minnesota. We are telling you today that we understand that climate change is real. No, it's not popular, as it was said here. Oh, this is a popular phrase. Climate change is real. We believe in science. And we also know that you elected us to implement policies and secure resources to address water and air pollution chemical and air and oil contamination, and to push for land conservation, management, and the protection of our ecosystems. Members, we are not doing anything related to that in this bill. I also want to tell you that the Walls Flanagan administration opened an opportunity for us. In their proposal, they ask something completely unprecedented. They ask us to invest $189 million to address these issues. You know what was our response in committee? For the first time, we didn't even give the governor the courtesy to hear his bill. I have been here 16 years. We hear the governor's bill, even if we disagree, even if we just say, well, thank you for your information. You are the governor. We didn't even do that in committee. So we couldn't hear. We had it in front of us, and we could, you know, we could hear it. The governor asked that we put $5.5 million in forest management, $10 million in grasslands and wetland restoration, $13 million for stream restoration, 24 million for land acquisition, 10 million for fish hatcheries, 
8 million for parks and trails, 10 million for public access, public water access, 15 million for storage and water management, which all of you are complaining about having problems in your districts, 54 million for land adaptation and action grants. We didn't even hear his proposal. Members, we need this funding, we need these resources. And since we didn't have the chance to talk about climate change in the Environment Committee, <laughs> we didn't hear any scientist, we didn't hear people from the University of Minnesota, we didn't hear anybody. You know what we did? We heard the Chamber of Commerce every single day. This bill was presented by the Chamber of Commerce. Actually, they wrote the bill that limits the agency's work. That is what is in this bill, is the, chambers, the Chamber of Commerce, and, and the chair is saying that. You know, he, he doesn't have a problem saying, well, you know, this is about business. My proposal is about business, and did it is, because the Chamber of Commerce wrote this bill. So because we didn't have the chance to talk about environmental policy, I would like to remind you, members, that tomorrow is Earth Day. And we're going to celebrate with our constituents. I hope you do. And I hope you remind them that it is our responsibility today, tomorrow, and every single day to work with every Minnesotan to stop the devastation that is produced by climate change. That is what you elected us to do. So, Mr. President, thank you for giving me the opportunity and the time to talk about something that is incredibly important to most Minnesotans, but most importantly, to our staff and to members that really spoke today about what you value and what you want to do for our state and for our planet. We're counting on you. The future of our state, of our economy, of our farmers, they are counting on you. Stay strong on this message. This is not a popular message. It is a message about our future. We need to do this work, and this bill does nothing nothing to move us forward. Please vote no. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank Senator Torres Ray for all she just said because I think she summarized it well. And one of the things that I, she reminded me of when she was mentioning the Chamber of Commerce, liking all the things in this bill, they sent out a letter that Senator Ingebrigtsen distributed on the floor has a line in it, a really powerful line. It says, protection of our natural resources is of the utmost importance. But then the rest of the letter contradicted that and suggested we should do the opposite, that everything else seems to be more important. And when we look at I just wanted to speak, the only point I wanted to make was on the budget. We, so far, the Senate majority has passed bills or passed to the floor bills that allocate $14 billion dollars $14 billion over the next three years for environment and natural resources. This total bill in those three years, it looks to me like it's under $14 million. In other words, $1 for every $1,000 you're allocating is all we're going to give to the environment. And of that, 100% of the general fund, lottery and loop funds, 100% of that's going to a sports event promotion, not natural resources, not habitat, not protection of the environment, but for promoting big sports events. I think as Senator Rood mentioned earlier, that's really, really outrageous to use those lottery and loo funds for that purpose. But in terms of priorities, tomorrow is Earth Day and today we're passing a bill that seems to not give a rip about the future of the planet. I'm really disappointed in the bill and I think Senator Torres Ray said it pretty well. I just want to urge you to vote against it as well. Closing comments to the bill, Senator Murphy. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, members. Uh, I am like Senator Isaacson in that I love to fish. Uh, I learned to fish uh, when I was 12 years old. I caught more fish than my brother with a cane pole. We used corn for bait sitting along the shore uh, of the Mississippi with my grandparents. I'll never forget it, especially because I beat my brother. That was awesome. Uh, I have been trout fishing uh, near La Crosse, Wisconsin. I've been to Canada, where you catch fish like crazy. Of course, northern and walleye in the lakes here in Minnesota. I've also been deep sea fishing, which was exciting, except for that I didn't take anything for seasickness. Um, so I got chum in my hair and puked in the bathroom, and I was the only woman on the boat, so everybody knew that was me. Uh, but I did catch fish, and that was very exciting. Uh, when I think about the bill that we've taken up today, it makes me think a little bit about floating down a river uh, slowly without a motor, which is nice, uh, but not catching a lot of fish. It's, it's okay. It's not great. Um, this bill is okay. It's not great. Um, What's missing, I think, is the real opportunity that we have every single time we move a piece of legislation like this to do something really important for the people of Minnesota. And I think this bill, like floating down the river, um, misses a real opportunity. Now, let's remember this debate is something about an issue that most Minnesotans care deeply about, something that we cherish here in the legislature and that is about the state of our place. It's about Minnesota. It's about our people. It's about our state's history as an environmental leader. It's also about the generations of Minnesota leaders on both sides of the aisle. And it's hard not to think about Willard Munger right now, but generations of leaders, both sides of the aisles, who understood that our 10,000 lakes, our clean air, our clean water, our parks, and our trails are part of who we are as Minnesotans and that they are worth protecting and protecting vigorously. Members, I know, like me, you have been to a beautiful lake or alongside the Mississippi River that goes right through the district I represent, that you have biked a trail or you've taken a trip to the crown jewel of the Boundary Waters. And we invite people to Minnesota all of the time to take advantage of what we know is the most beautiful part of Minnesota. Minnesotans cherish these experiences, these experiences, the hunting, the fishing, the boating, the hiking, the snowmobiling. They understand that we all benefit from the resources of our state, the resources with which we have been blessed. And they also understand that we will continue to benefit into the future if we don't take those for granted. Senator Dibble asked for me the right question today. Why doesn't this majority want to do all it can do to protect these assets, these resources, for our children and for our grandchildren? And why aren't we working harder to protect our climate, the sustainability of our future? Why aren't we thinking about our kids and our grandchildren as we take up this debate today. You know, Senator Marty offered an amendment, a smart amendment, bipartisan vote to try and contain CWD to protect deer hunting in the state of Minnesota. We didn't pass that. Both Senator McEwen and Senator Isaacson offered amendments to protect us from heavy metals like lead exposure and cadmium. We didn't adopt those. And Senator Dibble, he brought up a very simple but meaningful critical effort on greenhouse gas emissions. And I have to say I was a little surprised to hear a reaction by the majority that puts in doubt their belief that climate change is actually real when the science is crystal clear about it. And we have a tornado in December in Minnesota. That's a proof point as well. So when I think about this proposal, what it could be, and what it is, what I think is that this is a failure of leadership. And the reason why is because the majority of this body has decided to pump nine, more, uh, nearly $8 billion, nearly $8 billion into permanent tax cuts. And because of that, 
there's only about $1.4 million of general fund going into this proposal. This important proposal about our future and about our kids and our grandkids' future. That's the, that's the loss in this opportunity today. And we're walking away. We're not taking full stock of what we could do with a $9 billion surplus. And instead, we're taking a pass. We're floating down the river. It's nice. It's not great. We're not going to catch a lot of fish. We're not going to build a future that I believe that we can and Minnesotans deserve if we're not willing to stand up for the natural resources that make Minnesota great. So to the Minnesotans who cherish our state's unique environment and who use our lakes and streams each and every day all year long, we hear that that matters to you and we're gonna to continue to fight for you. To Minnesota families and businesses who cherish and rely upon our clean air, our clean water, and our sustainable climate. We hear you and we're gonna to continue to fight for the opportunities that this bill has missed. This entire session we have put forward alternatives that keep faith with Minnesota's bipartisan history of environmental leadership, but once again the Republican majority has blocked them. We've seen that today. Today we have once again failed to meet the moment for Minnesotans to take advantage of the opportunities our budget surplus presents to protect and enhance our environment. Unfortunately, if we pass this bill, we have failed to lead for Minnesota, and I urge a no vote. Thank you, Mr. President. To the author of the bill, final comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to the co-authors of the bill, I guess. Closing comments, Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I have to tell you how disappointed I am in this bill. So it contains none of the things that we worked on all session long. We passed out a committee, many committees, the Watercraft Education Bill, something that's really important to Minnesotans, something that really, when we have the highest death rate on the waters that we've had in decades, that we cannot pass Watercraft Education Bill. Personally, I support the four walleye limit. We've been working on that for years, and the guides and, the and, the, and all the folks around the, the state that use our waters knows that, that that resource really needs to be taken care of. That's not included. We also had the lottery and lieu bill. Do you know that not right now, we only get 72% of the money, and it used to be 97%? And we had a bill that went, flew out of committee with bipartisan support to make sure that that money gets put back in where the voters voted for. We also had stop over salting. How many committees has that gone through? How many of you have voted for that? And we still don't have it done. But the thing that, that I find most egregious is using and taking the environmental trust fund money. You know, the proponents of the bill say that the state needs to set up an organized and funded mechanism to give the state a better chance of winning bids for sporting events out of our environmental money. Do you know what the voters voted for? Here's what they voted for. 50% of the receipts must be deposited in the Heritage Enhancement Account in the Game and Fish Fund to be spent on activities to improve, enhance, or protect fish and wildlife resources including conservation, restoration, enhancement of land, water, and natural resources of this state. 22% of the receipts must be deposited in the Natural Resources Fund and may only be spent for state parks and trails. 22% of the receipts must be deposited in the Natural Resources Fund and may only be spent on metropolitan parks and trails. 3% of the receipts must be deposited in the Natural Resources Fund and spent only on local trail grants. And 2% of the receipts must be deposited in the Natural Resources Funds and be spent only for the zoo and the zoological gardens, Como Park, the Conservatory, and Duluth Zoo. That's what the people in the state of Minnesota voted. They did not vote to use this money for sporting events. And I think that this is really a a sad day in the state of Minnesota 
that we would divert the funds from the environmental trust funds to spend on sporting events. And I know it's only 1%, but you know what, 72%, there's 28 one percents. So let's think of that. So the next group that comes in and said, well, I just want 1% of that money, and I want to, gosh, what do I want to do? I want a hockey rink up in Duluth. So I'm just going to take 1% of that money. Oh, gosh, now there's 27 one percents. And now I can take that. So we keep chipping away at it. We keep diverting the funds, and that's not what Minnesota voted for. So today, I am really disappointed in this bill. And I just have to say, as as chair of the policy committee and vice chair of the environment committee, I couldn't be more disappointed today. Closing comments, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And, and a, uh, on a more lighter, less lighter note, uh, members, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. And I think the Minnesotans that are paying attention today are, are being led down a, a little bit of an uh, offside trail, if you will. They've been swerving a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right. Folks, you can be very proud, each and every one of you in here, and especially the older ones that have been around since the legacy, since the passing of LCCMR, that the Minnesotans said, we are going to spend money on our environment, we care about our environment, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to, we're going to raise this money. And you did. And we have for years spent money on the environment. I can't even, a couple of years ago, I tried to figure out how many billion dollars it has been, additional money that we've spent on the environment because of the people that sent us here want that to happen. And we do it year after year after year after year. Last year was a budget year. We spent more on, on environment and natural resources than we normally do. I went through those figures with you before. This is not a budget year. I know that can't get into anybody's mind when we're sitting with this money in the, in the bank, but, but this opportunity to, to, to just grab that money and make government grow is just, it's, it's just unbelievably strong. And, it's, and, and I can hear it in this, in this body today talking about the environment bill, and that's really unfortunate. But I have to start out by saying thank you to Senator, Senator Rood for her work that she's done on this, uh, on this committee. Uh, she's done a lot of work, as she said, about on the, on the salt, SALT bill. That SALT bill is still active, folks. You need to know that. It's still active. It's sitting in the Finance Committee. And if Senator Rood wants that bill to go forward, I think she'll make it, make it happen. So let's not, let's not just say, you know, throw these things out. Uh, but I want to thank the staff. I want to thank Jesse and Garrick and the nonpartisan staff, Ben, Dan, and Laura, who have been tirelessly on the floor here helping out during this. Uh, and along with uh, Vice Chair Senator Root, I, I, and a special thank you to Senator Torres Ray and, and uh, Senator Dibble and, and Eaton for their input in the, in the committee. And it's, it's been nothing short of a pleasure uh, uh, having that bantering, if you will, back and forth. And that's what that's what's all about down here, folks. And, and let's not fool each other. Uh, we have to have some some good, honest discussions going on. And not always do we agree with one another, but at the end of the day. We treat everybody with respect. Members, this is a good, this is a good bill. Is it the fix-all for everything? Uh, no. And let me go on the record and say I know the globe is warming, folks. It has been warming for thousands of years. Nothing appreciable but a thousand years. So let me go on record to say that I do not deny that the globe is warming. But I'm not about to hear this. I'm not about, you're not going to hear me or hopefully anybody in my caucus or even in this body trying to scare people into spending billions and billions of dollars because the earth is going to burn up in nine years. That just, I'm getting way off track here, mem members. I just, I just need to know, you just need to understand that there's two sides to every, every, every situation. So members, uh, this, this has been a great discussion today. We, uh, we went over everything uh, that I thought that we would be going over. Good discussions, close votes, uh, so everybody, uh, Everybody that's listening and paying attention should know that the, the Senate is doing uh, due diligence to the, uh, to the environment today, Earth Day tomorrow. They can be very proud. We can go out and say, we've spent literally millions and millions of dollars the way you've wanted it to be spent on our environment over the last years, and we're going to continue to do that. 
You could be very proud of yourself. Members vote green. Thank you. The Secretary will take the roll on final passage of Senate File 4062 as amended. Call on Senator Duckworth to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes yes. Anderson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Benson votes yes. Sen Benson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Gazelka votes yes. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Johnson votes yes. Johnson votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Miller votes yes. Miller votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Rosen votes yes. Rosen votes aye. Senator Duckworth. Senator Thomasoni votes yes. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Duckworth. And Senator Lang votes yes. Lang votes aye. Call on Senator Frentz to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Champion votes no. Champion votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Clausen votes no. Clausen votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Lopez Franzen votes no. Lopez Franzen votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Kent votes no. Kent votes nay. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes no. Newton votes nay. Senator Frentz. Senator Isaacson votes no. Isaacson votes nay. Senator Frentz. Senator Fateh votes no. Fateh votes nay. Senator Frentz. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes nay. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 37 ayes and 29 nays, Senate file 4062 as amended does pass and is title agreed to. <laughs> Remaining under the order of business, motions and resolutions, we will refer to, revert to the third order of business, messages from the House. The secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House has appointed a committee of five members of the House to act with a similar committee on the part of the Senate to escort governor, the governor to the joint convention to be held on, in the House chamber on Sunday, April 24, 2022, said joint convention to be convened at 5.45 p.m. and said message of the governor to be delivered at 6 p.m. Agjabe Frederick Cleborn DeMuth Nelson N. have been appointed as such committee on the part of the House. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. No action is required. Remaining under motions and resolutions, the Secretary will report Senate Resolution 128. Senators Miller and Lopez Franson introduced Senate Resolution Number 128, a Senate resolution relating to the appointment of a committee to escort the governor to the House chamber for a joint convention. Senator Housley. Mr. President, I move that Senate Resolution Number 128 be adopted, and it, members, it's on your desk. Members, all of those in favor of the resolution, please, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion does prevail. The resolution is adopted. Pursuant to the foregoing resolution, I make the following appointments. Senators Duckworth, Jasinski, Abler, Torres Ray, and Putnam. Announcements. Senator Pappas. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Hur and I just want to make everyone available that this is Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month. In 2013, the Minnesota legislature passed a bill, which I was honored to be the author of, designating every April as Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month. A century of genocides all began in April. Six genocides have official memorialization this month. The genocide of the Armenians, the Holocaust, the genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda, Cambodia and Darfur. Millions of people perished and communities, nations and environments were ruined. Today there are genocides in Ethiopia, China, Myanmar and Ukraine on our watch. 
We recognize the brutality in Myanmar after last year's coup. More than 1,500 Burmese, Karen, and Karani throughout the country have been killed. 10,000 people are imprisoned, hundreds have been brutally tortured, and more than 500,000 have been displaced. Senator Herr. Thank you, uh, Senator Pappas. Senator uh, Another catastrophe that we acknowledge today is the genocide of Hmong people in Laos during the Vietnam War and ethnic cleansing of the Hmong hiding in the highland of Laos. The Hmong suffered grievously during the Vietnam War. Because of the shortage of American troops in Laos, the U.S. military used the Hmong as a proxy army. When Americans withdrew, the Hmong were labeled as traitors, and the Petit Lao announced that they would exterminate it to the last route. Over 100,000 Hmong died trying to escape, either through assassination or by drowning in the Mekong River. Today, we recognize Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month and pay tribute to the millions who have perished, including the native people in our own country. We must ensure that the list of April genocide does not get longer. Thank you, Mr. President. Remaining under the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask uh, Senator Kiffmeyer to yield for a procedural question. Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, this is uh, according to uh, protocol, I ask you the question. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, the President if uh, um, Senator Kiffmeyer could give me, enlighten me just a bit, because she mentioned yesterday that this might be the last meeting of our Committee for State Government and Finance. And uh, I didn't know at the time that we had another bill that, uh, and I believe it's Senator Curran's bill, that uh, has been in the to-do list for the verification and validation of contracts. And I'm wondering if uh, Senator Kiffmeyer can uh, enlighten me if she plan, does plan to call a meeting to uh, take up that bill. So Senator Carlson, actually you can directly ask that question as long as you ask that the Senator yield. So you're perfectly with under asking her that directly. However, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the question. So in regards to that, I misspoke yesterday. And as I started speaking and saying it might be our last committee hearing, I'm reminding myself, uh, wait a minute, and I think I did kind of say, uh, we may be having another committee hearing. So it was just a misspoke uh, in regards to our schedule. Further announcements. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Latz all day, Senator Westrom from 11.15 to 11.45 a.m., Senator Lopez Franzen from 2 to 4.15 p.m. Any further announcements? Senator Housley. Mr. President, I move that the Senate now move to recess. Um, it probably won't be that long, like 30 minutes or so, and when we come back, we will just need a skeleton crew. We won't be doing any other business of the day. To the motion to recess to the call of the president. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? The motion does prevail. The Senate stands in recess.